I should be, it sounds like. Yeah. Well, I've got now introduced something that I didn't think I'd not thought about. Okay, okay. Okay, good evening, everyone. This is uh, I'm Realm Media's, hopefully, not the last, but certainly the first uh, presentation of things that are being born out of uh, events that are raised on the Have No Sphere podcast. So tonight, um, I'm going to be joined by, obviously, the obvious crew, Josh, Walt, Zach, John, and obviously the uh, killer koala. Who's, he's been rather busy recently fighting bushfires, but he's managed to join us tonight, Rob, from Australia. Um, and, and the reason we're here tonight is is to discuss from one of the podcasts we had, which was the uh, the Bible is not a flat earth book presented by Travis, a plain truth. Um, I, from Don, John directly, and the guys over at Ball Busters, had a... Uh, a number of initial requests early on to to respond to this and um secondarily i've i've had a number a lot of prompts in chat in the various places i attend to uh, to allow so and telling me i'm looking forward to so and so it is tonight i want to introduce I'll, I'll don't need to introduce you to the other guys so i'll just start with um ladies first as always uh so good evening, Paula, uh, Bible literist and a fellow ball buster. Good evening. Thanks for having me. And secondarily, John, good evening, Quantum. How are you, mate? Doing just fine, sir. Thanks for having me. Brilliant. Well, like I said, the, the rest of the guys, do you want to say a quick hello, guys? It's, it wouldn't be right, would it, without... Nope. Hello. And to everyone out there, I haven't been fighting fires. And a uh, shout out to all the people who have been fighting fires down here. They're doing a tremendous job trying to trying to battle those fires. Nobody else. Hi. <laughs> Get on with it, Adam. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, no, highly enthusiastic we saw from the guy. Okay, so, John. We've been here now. Like, well, no, well, before I asked John to start, like I said, it was, I've had a, a bit of a response um, to this, and I don't know what you guys are responding, but certainly for me, and initially I wasn't understanding why, and maybe that's because I'm not a Christian. Yeah? So I don't understand it, but from view, you know, pondering on the matter, it was kind of obvious to me that actually, what Travis is saying is, if you do believe that the Bible is the written word of God, that actually there's a there's a hell of a lot of issues here, and that's not necessarily the the case for me, but um, and and not necessarily why I disagree with some of the things that Travis said, you know, but um. Certainly for a lot of people, that is the case. And I thought it was really pertinent that actually, not for me, but actually for, for a lot of the people I know, that actually this is a relevant issue. And I wanted the opportunity for a, a retort from the kind of standard position with regards to how this is viewed initially, what Travis has said, um, and then maybe a little bit more theology, and I think that's why Paul is going to help, particularly after John makes retort to some of what what Travis has said. So, like I said for me, I'm 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 really interested because I'm not I'm not to, to, to nick a phrase a Bible literalist, um, but I certainly have respect and interest in what those that do hold that opinion opinion have, just as I think. Josh started the, the 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 initial show. The Bible is not a flat Earth book, with regards to what Travis was going to say. So, in the interest of balance, John, over over to you, mate. And uh, like I said, when you want us to stick in, if you hand over to Paula first, maybe after you've finished, and then we'll we'll leave you know, leave from there, pal. And uh, over to you, pal. 
Sure. How many Johns are on the panel? Yeah. Two. Two. It's probably best to say QE. Or just call me Savage. Savage. We'll stick with Savage for uh, our John and uh, you're all right, QE. You can and, be John. And QE. So you're going to send it over to me. We're going to do a little introduction here. Send it over to Paula and then we'll start off the presentation. Is, is that the scenario? Uh, I will leave it with you now, sir. It is entirely in your hands. So okay. um, when you want okay. me to present, let me know. And other than that, you the daddy. You can go ahead and present the screen. Okay. Just just let me know when it's up. Okay, you're up now with a uh, travesty presentation. Yeah, this is a travesty presentation against Travis's podcast. This presentation was more or less complete two days after his podcast on your channel but being that it was you know the holiday season uh people were going every which way uh it, it took some time to get this um how would you say published so opportunity opportunity to air <laughs> opportunity to air not error but uh, air. air because the error was completed with the first podcast right um how do i want to say this this that podcast i was so shocked personally that this is hovering right below third grade catholic school bible bible acumen to me personally i'm going to show you why step by step and there's going to be no doubt by the end of this presentation uh why that is and why i hold that position uh, this is going to be real easy. Uh, he, it, it appears that he was using some type of uh, what he called master's degree in biblical training to, how would we say, subterfuge the word of God. That's what happened here. And I'm going to show you that. So we're going to take all of his comments. Well, I didn't take all of them because we'd be here all night, but I took the big guys out and and I think that that'll, that'll do the job. So before we begin, uh, anything from Paula, Bible literally? Yeah, I guess I would just say is that the, the thing that underlies this whole issue of whether the Bible says this or that, if it's flat or round or if it's young or old earth, um, it's all about what you know, mainly reading comprehension and how you approach any text, because the Bible is literature, and it should tell you how to read it, as anything would. If you find something that says this is a fictional tale of such and such, then you take it all as fiction, even though it might have true statements in it. You know, such such as you know, one and one is two. But when it comes to the Bible, suddenly people think you should throw out all the rules of literature and grammar and context and make a story out of it. So I, I would just open with Proverbs 18, 17, which says that a purse to present their case always seems right until they're cross-examined. And that's basically what you're about to present. And so it's really not about what the Bible says it's as much as it is about how the Bible should be read, which is allegory against what's called the literal historical grammatical hermeneutic. Hermeneutic is just a method of interpretation. And those two methods will never come to agreement on anything. So just to understand the context of the whole point here and why Christians disagree, because it's a matter of how anyone thinks the Bible should be approached. So it it shouldn't be a surprise that we'll come to wildly different conclusions on the text when one side says it's an allegory of something else and the other side side says no it's written as literal historical narratives so just to give that background on what we're looking at here kind of a, a little bit of a big picture well thanks paula uh adam are, are we ready to go whenever you are sir Please proceed. So what we're going to do is I'm going to play parts of the podcast uh, and we're going to take his words and then we're going to evaluate everything he says and see if it holds any water. So here we go. 
So, Travis. <laughs> yeah. Is yes, the, sir. Uh, is the Bible a flat earth book? <laughs> I've heard uh, that it is. I've heard that it isn't. All right, here we go. Travis, uh, the yeah. Bible isn't a flat earth book? <laughs> I, I uh, believe... Uh, what now? I believe the Bible is as much a flat earth book as it is about the end of the world. <laughs> All righty then. Travis, I believe the Bible is as much a flat earth book as it is about the end of the world, which it's not. Number one, we don't care what you believe, Travis. Number two, Let's deal with the end of the world first. We'll work our way backwards to forwards. The end of the world. You don't believe it's about the end of the world. Number two, Revelation 21.1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. And there was no more sea. The books prophesying the last days, i.e. the end of the world, are Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Micah, Nahum, Zechariah, Malachi, Revelation chapters 40 through 20, Jesus Christ himself gives detailed summaries of the end of the world in Matthew chapters 24 and 25, Mark chapter 13, Luke 12, 37 through 48, Luke 17, 20 through 37, Luke 21, 5 through 38. The studies of the last days, that is the end of the world, is called eschatology. You're following. So none of this exists for you, right? As for your flat earth book, it's not a flat earth book, right? Huh. Dr. Michael Heiser, renowned Bible scholar. And I quote, if one was truly consistent in interpreting the creation description in Genesis 1 at face value, along with other creation descriptions in both testaments, you'd come out with a round flat earth complete with a solid dome over the earth and the earth supported by pillars with Sheol underneath. Also, can you reconcile this contradiction? Now, I'm not going to spin forward because of time constraints, so we'll just I'll just tell everyone what you said, and they can find it from 143.12 to 143.48 in your podcast. Travis, so just like I would say that the story of God's relationship with Israel had a beginning and an end, in the beginning God created and an end, uh, the first heaven and the first earth passed away, okay? That's the book of Revelation. The Bible begins with the heavens and the earth being created, the Bible ends with the heavens and the earth being destroyed and made again, okay? But as I said at the beginning, I believe the Bible is as much a flat earth book as it is about the end of the world, which it's not. You can see the last statement right here connected with the statement above. Number one, God's relationship with Israel began in Exodus chapters 19, 5 through 6. Now, therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine, and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. It didn't begin in Genesis 1.1. You follow? Number two, here's the big one. How can the heavens and the earth be destroyed and not pass away, Travis? You just said they were destroyed, right? Up here, you said it's not the end of the world. It's not a it's not an end of the world book. So how can it be just de be destroyed and not pass away or not end? That's contradiction number one, right? There is going to, this whole presentation is going to be filled with non sequiturs, discontinuities, and contradictions. This is just the first shot across the bow. That's all I got for this one. Paula, anything? Yeah, he's, uh, again, this is from the allegorical presumption. Um, it doesn't 
have to mean anything. It can mean whatever the allegorist wants it to mean. That's the problem with allegory being imposed. It's actually begging the question, which yeah, underlying this particular question is, is the Bible an allegory or not? Like I said, we're never going to come to agreement, you know, coming from two, such two mutually exclusive hermeneutics. But even given that, there are some things we can agree on, which is, yeah, the Bible is primarily about the people of Israel. It's the story of, of creation, what went wrong, and the long road to recovery, and how it will end. That's what the Bible presents itself as. But once you impose allegory, you can make it mean whatever you want. So the fact is, yes, it is about Israel, but that's not all it's about. That's part of the whole narrative, but not the entire narrative. And so again, it's it's banging the question to say, well, I don't want to get too far ahead here, but um, to say that it's always only about Israel unless it says otherwise, that itself is a begging the question fallacy and making a presumption and then looking for, you know, drawing a wavy line around everything that you come across because, oh, this, this isn't uh, specified, therefore it must be Israel. You, you can't make that assumption, you know, but that's why he says those things is from his hermeneutic of allegory, which is, again, whatever you want it to be. And that's the problem. Anyone on the panel have well, anything so far? I'll offer that out to the guys. Any any input? There? I've, I've only got one real question, but I, I would only say, did um, Travis stipulate that this was his opinion or? No, he made the statements that he has a master's degree, like he said a number of times, in Bible training, whatever that is. So he used his position as a master's degree in Bible training to give you his take on what the Bible says. So what we're going to do is we're going to show you what the Bible says. I think... And, and I, <coughs> go ahead. No, no, you go first, Paul. I was just going to say a degree in, in what do you say, Bible? Just a degree in Bible? Bible training. Uh, training. What does that even mean? I mean, Don't I know. could say I have, you know, it's like saying you have a degree in science. Um, what does that mean? <laughs> There's usually a specialty, especially at the postgrad level, the master's level. You have written a thesis on some topic. And where was this master's degree from? What institution? It, it's just... It's, it's a, a, a baseless statement that I think could be taken as an appeal to authority, actually. I think, I, for me, uh, the bit you've highlighted there, uh, John. Yeah. Um, no, QE, John, not, Sav not Savage, um, is, because it's something I've, I've thought about a lot when I've, read a, a lot of the bible and um, there are obviously points where it's clear a parable for example it's clear it's clear but i just wonder in the majesty of creation whether or not god is clever enough to create allegory in history would be my Certainly, only point I mean, we're, we're, we're gonna get to that we're, we're gonna okay. get we're gonna get all heavy all over that here in a few minutes. Okay. So what? Well, let let carry on then, pal. Is that I, I do I do realize that what I'm going to present um, in this discussion is it's going to elicit some strong responses from audience members, um, and I, you know, in all honesty, when I when I talk about this idea with Christians, I get the same kind of knee-jerk reaction, rejection, cognitive dissonance, stiff arm, as I do when I talk to a baller about the shape of the earth. They do not want to hear it, which I find completely ironic.
I bet you do. Travis, I do realize that what I'm going to present in this discussion is going to elicit some strong responses from audience members. In all honesty, when I talk about this idea with Christians, I get the same kind of knee-jerk reaction, rejection, cognitive dissonance stiff arm as I do when I talk to a baller about the shape of the earth. They do not want to hear it, which I find completely ironic. You do. Number one, it's a stereotype fallacy. Christians, right? Always followed by a straw man and or generalized sweeping ipsy disgust baseless fair assertion fallacy. This time it's accompanied by three anecdotal fallacies and a belly laughing false equivalence fallacy that is ballers and Christians leading to a feeble poisoning the well fallacy. I mean, you almost celebrated at least a third of the logical fallacy catalog just with this statement. Number two, perhaps the knee jerk reaction rejection stiff arm is because you're an abject moron. You ever thought of that? In much the same way as we knee jerk reject stiff arm the corner village idiot, right? You see how we do that? So you ain't saying anything here. You're just trying to grease the skids for your non your up, upcoming nonsense, right? Let me continue to 126.23. So there's there's something in a Christian's mindset where they have a certain commitment to biblicism, scientism, biblicism. They've got this scientific scientific evidence of what? They've got this. Am I here? I don't hear anything. Am I am I talking? No, you're there. Oh, yeah. 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 We're hearing you, sir. We're right here with legalistic you. point of view with the Bible. Everything's very legalistic. I think. Yes, yes. Right. They've got this. They've got this commitment to it, and there is nothing that is going to uh, shake them from this foundation. And I, Travis. So there's something in a Christian's mindset where they have a certain commitment to biblicism, scientism, biblicism. They've got this scientific, uh, am I here? Yes, this commitment to it that there's nothing that is going to shake them from this foundation. All right, Travis. Number one, stereotype fallacy again with Christian's mindset. Um, are you in Christian's minds to know what they think? As I said, it always leads to a straw man and, a, or, and or a generalized, baseless, sweeping, ipsy digs baseless, bare assertion fallacy, right? Which all this is. Number two, you know what's in other people's minds. Like I said, perhaps you should consider carnival as a vocation, Hey, eh? Number three, now you know you most certainly aren't there in more ways than one. And number four, are you, through voice inflection and suffix, suffix rhymes, attempting to somehow equate a commitment to God's word with pseudoscience? Is that what you're trying to do here? This is pathetic. Comments, questions, Paula. Yeah, it, it presents a false dichotomy. Either you're an allegorist or you're a legalist. Those are the only two choices given. There's nothing in between that somehow being a literalist means that you believe, for example, that Jesus is a tree because he said, I am the vine. And that's not what that means. I have a whole video on what the literal method means, what it is and is not. And so he is, like he said, greasing the skids and presuming that the reason, and, and I, there's another video I did called Because. As soon as somebody says, you disagree because they've lost the argument, because they, it, yeah, because hard word to ignore, but they are attributing to you motive, fault. There's something wrong with you for disagreeing with me. There's something wrong with you for taking the Bible literally. It's a very arrogant attitude that I find. I'm willing to let people disagree and allegorize all they like, but as soon as they say there's something wrong with me because I don't allegorize the Bible, that's where I have a problem. Okay. So maybe yeah, I think I, uh, just uh, if if someone uses the words cognitive dissonance these days, it alerts us to us. We we try not to do it. So if if we're in a discussion where someone uses those words, 
we sort of back off as well. We'll we might listen more to a person if he uses those words. Do you do you understand what I what I mean there? Yeah, I, that's what I'm saying is that he is uh, making presumptions about the person, what's wrong with them for disagreeing. Oh, and uh, that's that's an issue. Oh, it's the whole no, not a person, the whole Christian community. He said Christian's mindset. How does he well, know yeah. it's in the Christian's mindset? Exactly. How does he know that's, that my mindset is a little different from yours, Paula? How does he know that? That he's saying right. that we all have the same mindset we don't we're all individuals yeah we're, we're somehow brainwashed or indoctrinated those are favorite words that people throw around you know even other literalists on different topics will do the same thing it's a people problem not a position problem exactly well let, let's in the interest of my and and ironically the person that would talk me to be like this after being analytical in the interest of no longer you greeting your skids uh mr eraser paula yeah, let's have, have some of the facts and some of the analysis of these things so that maybe no skids are greased we just deal with information and facts that are presented so yeah, I hand over to yeah, you to, to go dealing. exactly. So let me hand over to you to to go through some because what you said there is based on what you're about to say, and that that's my point. It's not backed up. So let's 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 hear you both, you know, validate these assertions that relate to the and again for me relate to a viewpoint. Um, like I said, and I want to get into this later because. I don't think for one second you guys are suggesting black and white with the Bible. Um, uh, but I think you are maybe suggesting a, a, a difference between generic allegory and points where we can clearly see this allegory or there's, how would I put it? Like, well, like I said before, um, where Jesus said it is a parable or ne next where clearly there as you've referred to there's, there's points of allegory that where the text is descriptive without the the, the kind of pre-statement that this is allegory um so for, for learning so maybe you could just kind of address those for i think that's probably what's coming up we we haven't gotten there yet he has i know i should stop i'll oh, shut up i told you i should just shut up john didn't i <laughs> Uh, I'll, yeah. I will do so. Carry on. All, all he's done so far is what he's going to do through the whole presentation, by the way, is offer logical fallacy and baseless assertions. He hasn't he hasn't really made any claims yet. Let's see if he does in, in the rest of uh, the presentation here. We ready to roll? Am I up? We'll see. Let's do it. One second. Hold on, hold on a second, gentlemen. No, take your time. That's what it's like here on the realm. <laughs> That's a, it's a qualifying. Let me uh, go ahead and do that. One second. Why right, you're on, John? I got, I got a little bit ahead of myself. If I could so, do, I'd never leave the house. I'm 26, 23. And the way these videos go, you know how they go. You can never get them right on button. So we got 25 seconds left. Go ahead and smoke them if you got them. Uh, you, you just let it roll, mate. I've, I've switched it over, so you're okay. Um, but, yeah, whenever you're ready. What have I got? I've got to fill for 20 seconds. Not really. yeah, no, 15. <laughs> it's not a problem. By the time you have paused, and brought it to this point, I'm sure I could just probably say to you, tell you what, John, over to you, mate. Carry on and bring in whatever you're going to highlight now. Okay, let's roll. <laughs> I 
I grew up in, uh, I mean, I, I grew up in Southern California, so it's not the Bible Belt, but it's, it was the Bible Belt of Southern California. I mean, you know, it was a fundamentalist Baptist church where you didn't drink, smoke, or chew, or go with girls who do, you know, and you, uh, you believed that the Bible was 100% literal. The, it, what it says is what it means. It means what it says, and it says what it means, and um so he grew up in the bible belt in california and you believe that the bible was 100 percent literal it says what it means and means what it says um here we go again who cares where you grew up and the church that you attended it's utterly meaningless a third grade catholic schooler would laugh in your face with that 100 percent literal statement Anybody who has spent three hours or greater reading scripture knows with absolute certitude that the Bible is filled with rhetorical language, i.e. figures of speech, metaphors, similes, types, synecdoches, allegories, idioms, parables, puns, analogies, etc. There are over 200 types of rhetorical devices, not examples, employed. The examples range in the literal thousands. Moreover, 95% of the time, they, that is the figures of speech, are explained within the context of the passage or somewhere else in scripture. Shocking a master's degree holder in Bible training wouldn't know this as a well diapodictic indubitable. This is tantamount to a farmer claiming a chicken is 100% feathers comments questions on this because this is important to stop at yeah and the ironic thing you mentioned dr michael heiser before he is an allegorist he's also an old earth creationist um you know standard cosmology science all the way so you know air quotes and he says in one of the the quotes from his site that quote my view as readers know is that we ought to simply let the text say what it says and let it be what it is so and then he later says uh we dishonor the bible when we impose our own interpretive context on it so this is an allegorist disagreeing with another allegorist on whether or not we should let the text say what it says so the point is that if if someone says, you know, like he greets the skids again, saying I was in the Bible Belt Baptist and, you know, you take it literally, he's trashing the literal method on the basis of, you know, this is what I was, this is what I am now. And somehow this is assumed to be a step up where it's at least maybe at best a step sideways. But, you know, we could argue about that all day. But the point is that even allegorists don't all agree on making it all allegory they they do let the text speak they just have different spots at, you know different levels or whatever you want to call it where they invoke allegory and when you you show that there are all these genre all these figures of speech idioms expressions parables it all is contextual and that's why the literal method is not what people think. It's not saying that Jesus is a, a plant or a chicken or, you know, with his gathering people under his wings. We don't do that. That's not what literal means. It just means context. It means the opposite of cherry picking, which I think later he accuses us of, of <laughs> as if literal means cherry picking. It's oh, the farthest God. thing from cherry picking. Yeah, but we're gonna get to wouldn't, that. Wouldn't wouldn't yeah. um wouldn't wouldn't the Bible ha if it has metaphors and similes? I've never read the Bible, and sorry, but I never will. Um, metaphors and similes doesn't that sort of tell you that uh, uh, a man, a normal man, would have written the Bible and not would God have, no. would God use metaphors and similes while writing a book? Why not? I mean, we use this all the time, even in academia, they will use analogies to explain concepts. This is how we communicate, and this is how God reached down to us, to our level, so we could understand things. Just yeah, as that's, when that's, not, that's not me being so. argumentative. That's just that's just a sort of a right. thought that come into my head just there, you know, just a, a question that sort of come to me. Would, would God use similes right. and, and uh, uh, puns. Well, puns is a perfect one. Puns is a... I couldn't imagine a god using a pun. Why not? Yeah. Oh, god's no, got no, so no, much no, better. No, it's just, 
know? God, uh, Rob, uh, Rob, yeah, I can guarantee yeah. you now, God is so much funnier than you are, right? And the, uh, he would have no come up with a, no quite a witty one-liner. Yeah, in that it's situation. Yeah, well, it's God. It's God damn, he's funnier than you. Yeah. I would. I would like to ask. I don't know who God when, is. When you talk about the Bible, what what version of the Bible are you talking about? Or is it the original? Uh, if there is an original, is it the King James? Is it the any one of the other hundred and whatever there are? Versions There's. Of... Uh, I go to original languages. So Hebrew or. Yeah, Hebrew, Greek, and smattering of Aramaic, but that's just only in a, a part of a letter in Daniel, I think, Daniel. is the main one. But, right. Yeah. And well, there's a point to that, too. Well, <laughs> if you follow the script, I'm not going to get into that. There's a point to that part being in Aramaic. I, I have a real issue with Greek, right? Because, right. like, if I was to take the average Palestinian dude, and get him to just speak to a Greek bloke and get a translation. I would suggest that the Greek translation is, well, it's all Greek to me, yeah? Because Greek was is such a very... very whilst it has Paleo-Hebrew origins, I wouldn't dis, disascribe from that. I think the, 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 the timescale difference is so sufficient that greek um interpretations i would i would i would try to avoid if i was being sitting in that historical paradigm and then the greek Why? stuff is that because it's Why? so it, i'm gonna jump in i'm gonna jump in here in front of paula why would you do that when number one greek is alphanumeric just like hebrew number two it's hyper specific I mean, almost to the nth degree, and we have the Septuagint, which 70 Jewish scholars, they, under, they understood Hebrew and then converted into, into Greek. Why wouldn't you want that? No, oh, why? If Greek was sufficient, then why would Paula be looking, bothering to look? Well, Much well, harder to find antiquity resources. So, so no, it, it, it really is. Let, let me finish because it's not. It's not a point of con, of, of an, a, animosity. The point is, there are levels of when we talk about the King James version and interpretation. For me, there's there's a there's a way of validating that um, interpretation and languages that are similar. Um, have more validity, for sim simply, yeah. So, right. so, in terms of if I was talking to a French guy, I still haven't really got. From speaking to a Scottish guy, there's the similar language. To go from, <clears throat> if we place these events in Palestine, to go from there to Greek, the way we understand it in modern history. It's a very different paradigm, and it's a very different culture, and therefore. Yeah, but the whole it, world. You're missing something. No, no, no. The, 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 you've missed my whole final hold point. On a second. Hold on a second. No, no, no. I'm not holding on. My show, QE. So let me just finish this point. Yeah, and then and then I'll give it you, bro. My point is, even in 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 standard time, no translational, from that geographic location, there's still going to be translational issues and and cultural translational issues which are probably more important in any translational stuff but when we look at aramaic and that so a lot closer geographically and if if you do question chronology then actually and it's probably more than important point to 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 kind of support aramaic and and other Palestinian based scripts that aren't geographically located so far away is that chronology is 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 confused um and I think for me if I was going to and this is the final point man the original point if I was going to put any um rank order 
to my um, interpretations, my translations, then I would tend to do it on that chronology. I would tend to go further back and try to link those those languages to at least in at least in a, a character formation way, more relinked, more linked in an earlier way to the foundational Paleo Hebrew. Uh, in hey, terms Adam. of how I was going to rank it, I'll stop rambling, Paul. Yeah. Are, are you done? Um, no, yeah, I'm I, done. Hold on let a second. I'm going to re- I'm going to unleash Paula on you. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking second. forward to it. <laughs> I'm going to unleash her on you in a second. Uh, number one, I'm going to mirror this show, so it's going to be on my channel. So it's my show. Yeah, well, that, uh, that's good. And and <laughs> the only reason <laughs> I interrupted there is because <laughs> generally number this. Two, number two, yeah. I'm going to unleash Paula on you right now. Do it. Yeah, I did a whole presentation just on that issue. Um, language is complicated, but I showed the progression of the characters, and Greek is not out of line at all. And the Septuagint was made during the intertestamental period, several hundred years before Christ, when Alexander the Great, Greek was great, was running around, and he consolidated all the Greek dialects so that by the first century, when the New Testament was written originally in Greek, not in Hebrew, so that doesn't even apply to the New Testament, uh, it was stand more standardized, and it actually there were two forms of it, the classical formal Greek that almost nobody spoke, and the koine or common Greek, the Greek of everyday com- uh, commerce and business and conversation, and that's what the New Testament is written in. So when we talk about whether it should be translated from a quote-unquote Palestinian uh, culture and mindset, that was already happening. Everybody in that area was speaking Greek. It was the lingua franca of, of the time, just as English is now in most of the world. That's what Greek was. Everybody understood it. So it, there was no translation or cultural issue to overcome by the first century, certainly. And the reason why the Septuagint was made at all is because Hebrew and Aramaic were beginning to fade even before the time of Christ, such that the Jews were afraid their scriptures would be lost and unreadable. So they commissioned the 70 or 72, depending on who you ask, scholars to translate it into Greek so it wouldn't be lost. And that version is what Jesus and the New Testament writers quoted from. That's why it doesn't match a lot of times the quotes that uh, in English Bibles, for example, when you read something in the New Testament that quotes the old, the old, you go read it, it's not the same. It's not entirely different, but it's not identical because the Old Testament in almost all Bibles is translated from the Masoretic Hebrew text, which postdates the New Testament. So Jesus and the New Testament writers did not quote the Hebrew. They quoted the Greek Septuagint and considered it the very word of God in the scriptures. So all, none of that even applies to the Bible. And Greek is, you know, Hebrew is a very pictorial language. Yes, it is. It's a very good at telling a narrative, which is what it needed to do in the Old Testament. But Greek is a matter of fact, eyewitness testimony. Here is the evidence, very evidence-based uh, descriptive language as English is. And that's why I've gone over this in the series that I've been doing on, on the Ball Busters show, well, not on Ball Busters, but on Quantum Eraser's channel every other Tuesday. I've been going step by step by step through all of these things and all the background of the Bible. So none of that, those questions about language even apply because when you understand the progression and when things happen and why and who did it, all of those things melt away. Okay, I'll, I'll stop there. Oh, I think that's a, a good, a good retort to, to to what you said. The the only thing I would say there is, and at the point of concealment and contention as well. Uh, again, all these characters, the Greek, the the Hebrew, they all have their own, or they have the same base. Deriva- derivation as you've described um, my only point is culturally um, and that's why I lean whilst like I say in your chronology you lean towards the Greek um, 
are leaned towards the cultural as opposed to the uh, chrono I think chronological. That's a false dichotomy, though. Well, I, I don't I, see the problem. No, I, it, it's a very sort of nuance. If I'm being honest, it's like uh, you, you knew King James there. We, 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 me and Zach, Paula, were 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 chatting um, with a guy from Israel tonight, and um, we talk about we, we were talking about um, kind of synergy, and and Zach's been bothering to learn Hebrew. Maybe you can chip in, Zach, if you're still there, bro. Um But the the the, the maybe the point I, I'll make. Uh, I said to him, "Can you give me an example of where, from your understanding of the Hebrew and the New King James, it's not anything significant? But if you really want to understand the subtle nuances, maybe there is a difference there." But for the bigger scale, it doesn't really matter. For the real picture, it doesn't matter. And and he came up with with regards to the flood. Um, I can't, I kept thinking he said the flat, the flat, the flat. He kept saying that there, and it wasn't until later that he said the flood, the flood. The, um, and he was basically talking about the way in which the scripture talks about. Uh, the way in which the waters were released. Um, and I think in the New King James, uh, it's described as the windows in the heavens. Uh, in the Hebrew, it's described as the Aru, Avu, I'm not sure the, it sounded more Avu, the way he was saying it, but he spelled it A-R-R-U, Arubot. Um, what I'm saying is, if you look in the real detail, then the actual description is chimney, pipe or hollow tube um and i think if we're trying to describe when we're talking about the earth is not the bible is not a flat earth but it's these subtle differences that i think will allude to those points um but i think it's and this is the the crucial which definition which translation is the one to lead with, and in this case, windows, chimneys, or tubes. You go with the Septuagint. You go with yeah, the Septuagint. Is... I, I, let me get. Let me get in here, Adam. Alexander the Great conquered the known world. Right. The mm -hmm. Greek was the language of the world at that time. It's similar to Catholics and Latin. I mean, no one spoke Latin. Only the priest spoke Latin. All everyone spoke Greek. <laughs> so they had to, to convert the scriptures into Greek. There, there's no other choice, right? And you had 70 of the best Jewish scholars or Hebrew scholars converted into, into Greek, which is hyper-specific, right? So there shouldn't be a problem. Yeah, something is always lost in translation. That is going to happen. But again, since we have the, the Hebrew we have post-dates the Greek we have, the Greek weighs heavily as being an authoritative Hebrew-approved translation. And we don't have as many of the documents they had to work with. So whatever, like, for example, when they would translate uh, various names of God as simply Theos, which is as generic to them as God is to us, then they're telling us something. They're telling us that these other names are not the formal name of God. They're just different words, different cultures, different times for God. Right. You know, God is a generic term. So, yeah, things are always lost in translation. But, 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 but we have... Huh? Well, that, that's exactly... I'm not being um, overly um, aggressive. I'm trying to say, look... There comes a point where which 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 do you pick? If we pick the New King James, and if we are, we're if we're talking about descriptiveness, then descriptiveness is 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 getting is. We're all starting to agree on this. We're starting to get to the point. So where do we, from your guys' point of view, where which is the most definitive? Is my question to you? Is is it the Greek translation, which you know we see in the New King, or is it? 
the old I met him. So the, the, the bit, the uh, uh, I'm nearly there. I'm nearly there. The, the bit we've probably got to is for me: is it chronology or is it geography? So do we forgive a few years uh, and take that translation from a more regional point of view, or do we take the translation from um, uh, a more uh, from a modern chronology point of view, a more accurate transcription at the time, but still subject to what you were talking about, Paula, which is uh, translational issues. And to me, the biggest issue in terms of accuracy in anything, taken to somebody that got upturned in Rome because of translational issues, um, I would suggest if that man understood me, whether it took five minutes or ten minutes, he'd have still understood me. Translational issues were the problem there. Do you get me? So for me, the biggest, if I'm going to apply real um, uh, authority to my scripture, then the exact translation is important. So that's where do you guys call it? Do you get me? That's my, it's not, it's this, it's that. This. How do you guys call it on that? that that's my honest question. Well, this, this kind of touches on something that Travis had said, which is basically claiming to be what's called an infallible interpreter. There's no such thing. Mm. We're humans. We're all mistaken. That's why there are so many translations, because two people can look at any text in any language at any time, or even words in a chat rolling on YouTube and disagree on what it means. That's a, a person problem, and, and there will always be misunderstandings. Now, when it comes to, so each person's gonna have to decide how they determine, you know, what evidence points to, um, what's logically coherent. And for me personally, since you asked me personally, is that we get the oldest language we can get as close to the source as possible and do our best, okay? and when it comes to what's called textual criticism, which where they compare thousands and thousands of manuscripts and try to figure it out from there, then that's the best we can do. But there's surprising agreement when they're all compared, even between the Greek and, and the, the, the Septuagint and the uh, Paleo-Hebrew as much as we have of the Old Testament and just Greek and the New. You compare, you do the best you can, you try to find out how the words are used in all contexts, you, you create lexicons for these words, and you study the rules of grammar and do your best to figure out when something was literal, when it was a figure of speech, et cetera, et cetera. And then it's gonna be finally up to how you understand the passage, which takes us back to our topic. Is it allegory? Is it not? And by pursuing this thing about language is a whole topic of its own, we're really not going to answer that question. Yeah. So, but for me personally, I just think the older documents are better. Well, that, that as we, we do on our round, we, we do applaud a good link, Paula. So well done, mate, because that's, that's quality. So yeah, John, maybe we should just get back on track. I think that's been a good debate. I think the it, we can see there's, there's plenty there to, to, to chew. Do you know what I mean? I'm not being... That 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 what I was saying there were were, were genuine there. yeah questions valid valid, valid questions yeah. there but I think for the for the case of getting on with it this is um, we should hand it back to John yeah. and um, oh we're gonna be here for four more hours at this pace <laughs> eight, eight I, I've got on uh, my uh, on my sat well John I'll um QA, I'll say to you that you're in charge of the interruption so chuggle on. And maybe get no, no, to no, no, no. no what well, no, no. no they should be no people should no I don't want to go unchallenged here you need to stop no I'm good well, stop at my usual stops good because because oh. I'm enjoying it mate because uh, like I say yeah, these, yeah. these aren't points of particularly for me they're not points of objection the points where I'm asking for learning for to understand your more importantly to understand your viewpoint it's, if There'd be nothing easier for me to sit here falsely and say, I accept this, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. brilliant. And I'm only lying to myself. Yeah, I might look good to anybody else, but I don't. So genuinely, when I look at and, and you know Christians who, who say they've, 
they have all. I, I, I look with envy initially, yeah, because I don't have that, and I, I wish I did. But all I can try to do is try to understand what you're saying, right? So if any question comes out, it's from a point of curiosity, not aggression. Oh, yeah. yeah, you, oh, you, you I get. I'm with you, Adam. These these are the questions that got me banned from Sunday school. Yeah, so it's I'm like what? Go <laughs> yeah, Spot on, John. Yeah. I, I want you to stop. I want you to stop me because oh, I don't want to. Like I said, I don't want these things to go unchallenged. I mean, people can see through that quickly. You know, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure that out, and you're not going to do it anyway. So don't promise to. Listen, it's six thirty in the evening where I am. It's way later for you, so it's up to you. Yeah, I, I was just going to say, for what it's worth, that I was the person in Sunday school who asked the difficult questions, and it bothered me that nobody wanted to even talk about any of those things. And that's yeah. what led me to a life of Bible study because mm. nobody else wanted to talk about it. Mm. So that's what I did. So, so, right, so, 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 Paula, John, so, do you get my point? Yeah. Uh, and and I'm not asking for clarity for you asking to define whether it's a window, a pipe or a chimney but do you understand that actually right. if, if we're really going to analyze the bible this level of interpretation and that was not and and i didn't and i'm going to push you on this paula so i understood the point you make but you didn't clarify is it chronology or is it geographic location and how the hell do you mix the freaking two because i'm not asking you to define one but for me they're the things i look at and i'm thinking which one should i pick which is the one that I should work with? Do you get me? I, I think it's both and. I don't think it's an either <laughs> or. And that's probably why I, I, it seemed like I didn't answer your question because I'm like, well, why does it have to be one or the other? The, these are all just parts of the context and parts of the collection of as much as I can collect to make an informed decision. You know, so I'll look at the chronology and I'll look at the culture and I'll look at the language and try to get my head inside the narrative, you know, especially with the New Testament, which I focused on, is you when you spend that much time in it, you get inside the heads of the writers and you figure out what they're what they're about, what kind of people they were. And I'm not as much of that in the Old Testament because my, my specialty is the new, but that doesn't mean I don't read the old. But the thing is that when it comes to, you know, how do you weigh these things, there's a gazillion factors is all I can tell you. And I do try to weigh them all. All right. Before we uh, continue on, you asked me, I use the King James Bible. I use the Septuagint. I use the ESV, the English Standard Version, and the NASB. That's the question that you asked. I'm mm -hmm. giving you my answer. Cool. So... Uh, okay, so with, with that in regard, and I, I can only uh, speak from myself in terms of, uh, obviously, uh, you understand I've looked at to how to define this, and it's very difficult, uh, and there's certainly no clear answer. There's not a graduated scale of, as I alluded to, chronology versus geographic location that, that gives you any validity. So for me, the... The only thing I have as somebody with some resemblance of faith, anything, some some belief in the Bible, not like you guys that believe it's the holy word of, of God, but no, some belief. I don't believe it, I know it. <clears throat> Lovely for you, right? For you, right? I'm talking for me. Yeah? For me? Well, yeah, I'm talking about for me and how I'm navigating through this fucking mess. Yeah? Um, so for me, the words of Christ are still relevant yeah but um and in that sense there are certain fundamentals that that resonate with me and one of them is that he gives us the spirit okay yeah and in that that's something new that comes to humanity from my understanding of the bible yeah? something we didn't have before and when i read these things as a a child a young man a middle-aged man and uh, uh, whatever I am at 46, 47, you know, whatever oh, that, fart. yeah, yeah, broken ex down, disheveled, yeah, exactly. I, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Those things have meant different, and my spirituality has changed in those things, and the way I view some of the things that may be described in one way or the other, whether they're allegorical, you know what I mean? As I read them, 
Um, I I am given a, a different um, allegory to the text. The same text, the same person, but not the same spiritual being. Yeah, over time, and for me, the, the point of that I've learned from that is I don't really worry too much about the new king james this version that version whatever whether it's a chimney a window whatever it it doesn't matter because when i'm reading it and i and i'm genuinely reading it not talking reading off a screen talking with you guys but when i'm quiet and i'm engaged in the text then <clears throat> It either resonates or it doesn't. Yeah, and and it, I don't need a definition for it to mean something to me. Um, and sometimes I think we worry too much about definitions. Um, we forget about the gifts we've been given. Right, I agree. But at the same time, I think it's important to point out that that being the case, then why is it that so many people feel the need to disparage literalists when our opinion is as valid as anyone else's? It it's, has an equal place at the table. And so one is not superior to the other by any objective standard. Now, I have my personal convictions, of course, but I'm allowed to have them. And I'm allowed to say what I absolutely believe about what you know how we got the bible and what it, the words should be and whether it's important whether it's a, a tube or a window or a portal um but the point is that when people say the bible says this or that and i i might challenge them to show me where it says that um my my question is why do they bring it up if it's not important so it just doesn't it isn't consistent in my opinion that a, a person who uh, will say, I don't care. I'm not saying you personally, but just as a general observation that I don't care really it, it's about the message or what, or whatnot. Fine. But then don't tell me that I'm wrong. You know what I'm saying? That, you know, if that's the case, if it is what anybody wants to get out of it, then no one can be wrong. And yet the allegorists, especially astrotheologists or allegorists, syncretists or allegorists, um, Christian or not, anybody who takes the Bible as allegory, it, it makes no consistent sense for them to be upset with anyone who doesn't because it's just another viewpoint. Yeah, this allegory, whether it's allegory or literal, is nonsense. I just went over this, right? The rhetorical devices used in literature key you on whether it's going to be an allegory or historical narrative or not. This is common sense, folks. I'm telling you. <laughs> God didn't write equations in here. This is plainly written. It's only when man gets in there and starts mucking around, screwing things up. If you if you compare these scriptures, the Septuagint, I'm not saying my method's the best, but all you have to do, the ESV, the King James Bible, the Septuagint, and the NSB should do it for you. Comparison. It, I, I don't know what else to say to this. Uh, maybe we can move on. Yeah. Yeah. You think? Yeah. I think I think that's a, a good point. I think we've covered that. And I enjoyed that, John. So, yeah. Uh, I think okay. there is no, as we say, the, there's no definitive answer here, is there? It, it, you know what's yeah, most important? The definitive answer. Well, 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 no, what's most important, right? Whatever your viewpoint is, that you bother to read the bloody thing before yeah, you try and have true. a viewpoint. That's true. Yeah. A child can understand scripture. Well, you know what? It'll mean something to you, won't it? But read it first before you say whether or not it means anything. All right, we ready to roll? Tell yeah, me rock on, up. pal, rock on. Anyway, so most people think that the Bible is written in three languages. Uh, they think that it's written in Hebrew. They think that it's written in uh, Aramaic in certain parts. And then they think that it's written in Greek. Okay, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, three primary languages. But there is a fourth language 
that the Bible was written in. And if we do not know and understand this fourth language, we will end up misreading the Bible because this fourth language is the supervisor to all of the other three. The other three incorporate this uh, overseer's language in their presentation of their material. And uh, this is the way I phrased it, um, pilfering from the great J.R.R. Tolkien. There is one language to rule them all, one language to guide them, one language to reveal them all, and in the light, unbind them. All right? So the Bible is written in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. Yes, it's true. But all of those three languages incorporate the language of symbol, incorporate the language of typology or analogy metaphor, okay? The Bible is a book of metaphors. Now, <laughs> oh boy, Travis, most people think the Bible was written in three languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, in certain parts, Greek, but there is a fourth language the Bible was written in. And if we do not know and understand this fourth language, we will end up misreading the Bible because this fourth language is the supervisor to all of the other three. The other three incorporate this overseer's language in the presentation of their material. And this is the way I phrased it, pilfering from the great J.R.R. Tolkien. There is one language to rule them all, one language to guide them, one language to reveal them, all and in light unbind them. All right, the fourth language is symbol. They incorporate the language of typology or analogy metaphor, okay? The Bible is a book of metaphors. Really? Is this a metaphor? Mark 15, 24. And when they had crucified him, they parted his garments, casting lots upon him, what every man should take. Right? There goes your mind-numbing claim right there. How about the other 20,000 plus passages I could post? If the other three languages, listen to this, if the other three languages incorporate this fourth language that you conjured, and then how can we be misreading the other three? Reification fallacy, no language supervises any other language. You stated that this fourth language, the overseer, is symbol. Aren't Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek represented by symbols? Figures of speech, that's typologies, analogies, and metaphors, aren't separate languages. They're rhetorical devices employed within the language okay. used. You're so close. J.R.R. Tolkien, the author of The Hobbit, The Lord of the Rings, and The Sumerian, whatever that is, isn't a Bible scholar. Who are you going to source next, Mel Blanc? Analogy metaphor? The heck's that? Analogies aren't metaphors, and neither are types or typologies. Let me continue, 132.10. Now, again, you can, re, you can react to that in any way that you like, but that's the way that I'm going to present this uh, material um, for the rest of the time. So uh, this is, again, I'm trying to present to you. So if you, if like, I think what... Uh, We lost you, Joe. Yeah, I don't hear him. That you've... Oh, I'm sorry. I was on, my, on you. Oh, sorry, sorry. Right. You're right. Cool. Sorry. So up to this point, you've stated that you believe the Bible is not a flat earth book without a sliver of cowbell. You think you'll get around to that at some point, Mr. Master's degree in Bible training. Right? Travis. Christians think that the Bible is a flat earth book because of the way it is translated. Um, I know you can pick this out again. This is another stereotype fallacy, which again is always accompanied by a straw man or a clumsy, generalized, sweeping, ipsy, dixit, baseless, bare assertion fallacy. In this particular case, we can add a non sequitur fallacy. The way it is translated, number one, what's it? And 
Do you mean it was translated while eating a donut, biscuit, drinking coffee in pajamas versus formal attire? How about using a pen versus number two pencil? How about the differing lighting motifs? I'll stop it right there. I won't go into the other statement. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, it, here again, it's begging the question is, you know, you went into the details why, but uh, yeah, it, allegory is an interpretation, not a language. And as you pointed out, language is already a symbolic representation of thoughts and words and syllables. So it's, it's um, a mishmash of terminology, a word salad almost, because it really said nothing at all other than to say that he expects a reaction, which again is a disparaging remark, assuming that we only react and don't rebut his claims. And we're just trying to, to fearfully protect something that we hold dear without, uh, you know, out of me motion only, but that's not what we're doing. This is not a reaction, it's a response. And the response is that we're just exposing numerous fallacies and uh, a nonsensical statement about language that, again, you know, it's being needlessly complicated. So who is to decide what is meant? That's the whole question. Is it an allegory? Is it not? Who decides? Each person is going to have to for themselves, and each one can have their personal conviction, but this doesn't make one of them superior, which in my experience, tends to come from the allegory side. They believe they have moved up when they choose to allegorize instead of taking a literal method. They think it's better, a superior, inherently more spiritual and deeper understanding, enlightened, awoke, whatever you want to call it. That seems to be the attitude that this is what really spiritual people do. They always take it as an allegory and a symbol and a code. And um, I, we, we beg to differ, and uh, we're allowed to. I think I think that's a good point. Um, uh, it, it is a good point, and but it also raises the other point of who decides which version of the Bible is real and which one isn't. I mean, we all know in modern day copyright on the Bible needs to be ten percent different from the previous Bible, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I think that's a really good point you raised there. Um, but it also raises the point as to who decides which which Bible is right and which Bible is wrong. As we know, there's a lot of wrong Bibles out there, um, according to our understanding. But, I mean, just for me, I, I've gone past the point of regarding the Bible literally. Um, it, it's been changed so many times. Um <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, uh, go ahead. Well, uh, I'm, uh, <laughs> you know. well, maybe, maybe let's 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 not necessarily digress into that thing because I think well, that's a, that's a, just... that's fifteen and a half shows in itself, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah, yeah. No, she needs to respond to that because those yeah. are some ambiguous general. Well, I think claims. I think I think the point we probably we're getting to there are. Um, for me, the point I'm seeing there, there comes a point, and maybe this is a question for you, Paula and, and John, and maybe hopefully summarises it a bit. There comes a point where, and maybe I'll use Jonah and the whale, okay? Is Jonah and the whale only there to tell me that some bloke who needed to be taught a lesson got swallowed up by a whale? Or is there more stories that actually are more learning, not necessarily directly from learning in the Bible, but through spirit that I can learn through that and apply to my life. Um, if I, I if I choose <laughs> to take that text in an allegorical way, or should yeah, I it's only... It's not an allegory, it's a type. Well, that's what I'm saying. Or should I... Well, that's the point. Or should I only take that text as a factual representation that a biblical figure had these events occur to them. Could you well, two go? That's how, because I, I don't sit in your camp or Travis's camp, but I, I, 
Jonah and the Whale has a lot. You know what I mean? I don't want to say what it means to me, but do you get my point? It's not just necessarily. But would you address that, Paul, at first? But, but yeah. First of all, let me say about when when people say the Bible's been changed, what they mean is translations. There are many translations. But since we people always think of the what we call the telephone game, where you uh, say something, whisper something to someone in line, and they pass it on, and they pass it on, and they pass it on. But when it comes to the Bible, when it comes to the documents, we can go to the first or second person in line every time. So it's not a telephone game problem, and we're not talking about translations. Even we're talking about the Bible has not been changed. That's why we stick so hard to those original language documents because that minimalizes that problem when and, i say changed I, I mean there's a copyright thing at the moment if you well, create the bible it has to be 10 percent different from the previous or any other bible uh, or it can't be copyrighted in it, translation or i mean for example you know in the beginning god made the heaven and the earth uh, is it the heaven or is it heavens? It, if the Hebrew, it will be plural, and the Greek, it will be singular. The Greek Septuagint, they translated as singular. So, but assumably, point... we, we take the Hebrew as being the um, predecessor of the Greek. Well, but who's to say yes the no. Hebrew is not bastardized from something else? Well, as I said, there's the Masoretic Hebrew that came after the New Testament times, but there's Paleo-Hebrew, which came before the Septuagint, and the Septuagint was translated from. We don't have as much of that. That's why the Septuagint was made, but we're getting way off of what I wanted to respond to, which is... Yeah, okay, okay. Back, <laughs> yeah, back, bring, bring back it back on issue. track. <laughs> uh, I'll try. Uh, the, the problem is when people say Bible's been changed, like I was saying, it's translations. And the problem, the, the issue with translations is that, that languages are always changing, and that's why we need to keep translating the Bible, not only into different languages, but in the same language, um, people's expressions change. Like, for example, from 1600s, the word let has reversed meaning completely. It used to mean prevent. Now it means allow. So you have to understand, you know, what words people chose at the time that what they meant at the time and get a dictionary from that time. So the Bible is not changing. It's our languages that are changing. And so the Bible has to be retranslated and retranslated from the original documents as far back as we can get them. And that's yeah. how we avoid introducing and, errors. And okay? that's exactly my point. You know, like today, if you say something is wicked, then it's brilliant. If you right. know, fifty years ago, wicked would have meant you know it's devil possessed, it's terrible, it's exactly the opposite of what it's saying today. So right, and that's yeah, there that's the is issue. A problem with, with translations. Yeah. There is a problem with with what what when 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 it comes to Bible literalism, then you have to literally take these words for for what they no mean. no. Well, no, that's, again, that's not what the literal method means. It means recognizing all the layers of context, such as figures of speech. So, mm, okay. for, for example, when Jesus says, I would gather you as a chick gathers her hens under her, her wings, uh, we don't, literalists don't say Jesus is literally a chicken. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm with you. <laughs> yeah, so, so well, the, uh, the literal... Uh, sorry. Yeah, the, uh, the literal method is not the you know, a, what we call a wooden literal approach where you make it Jesus a chicken or you, you say, you know, some equally ridiculous things. And when you mentioned about Jonah and the whale, Jesus used that as an analogy, even though it, because it was a real historical event, he said, just as Jonah was in the, the belly of the fish for three days and three nights, so also the son of man will be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. So he's not appealing to an allegory. He's appealing to a historical event, which clearly did have more meaning than just the historical event, but it was a literal event nonetheless. So you can draw analogies from real things. And that's what I think the allegory method misses a lot of times. Do, do you think that, uh, I mean, back in the day, we, 
may have been able to take the Bible literally um, if, if we didn't know what we did know today. But do you think at this moment it's it's discernment that we need is to spit out the bones and realize what it's actually saying to us rather than honing in on every single word and even dating it back to the hebrew words which may not be the original we don't know they they could have been doctored by man as well i mean this is a man-made thing the bible i, do, is I know a, you now i'll tell you what there's so many points in scripture where i could i, I can burn that thing down well because it says in the book that this is the word of god then therefore it's no. burnt down no i i think this can be done just linguistically if nothing okay. else that 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 uh, and again, I've done this in presentations where I go over the, every one of those things that you raised and the principles behind how a text is assembled, how you deal with the grammar, how you understand it. And it's all something anyone of any religion or non-religion could do, and they often do. There are secular people who study, for example, the Dead Sea Scrolls without having any vested interest, any dog in the hunt, mm -hmm. on because they're professionals, you yeah. can trust them to first of all figure out what the words are and then try to assemble a dictionary and look at the artifacts and try to figure out how these words were used elsewhere and get, paint a picture of what was in the people's heads at that time. And that's what people do with the Bible. And, and again, this is asked out of, uh, from a position of respect, not from a position of provocation or anything. You know, this is, as Adam said, this is asked purely these are the questions that got me thrown out of Sunday school. So, <laughs> Right. I, I don't mind at all. But I, I do get passionate in my responses because it, a lot of times people don't realize what a deep question they're asking. It's it's when, you know, a, a child may ask um, something of their parents, like, for, for example, once my one of my kids asked me why there was only one moon. And, you know, the answer could take volumes. And yet that's what it is with the Bible. When somebody says, well, what about the languages or what about the story of Jonah? I could sit here for five hours and answer and not mm. feel like I did it justice. You know what yeah, I'm saying? So exactly. It's I mean, it, it's, me. it's a case of it, it's like I'm a child and I'm saying to you, how do you know the Bible is real? It's, it's, and that's a massive question that could right. take hours and years and uh, you know episodes to cover but it is that simple a question it's like how do you know it's real but yeah i understand i think john you've only you've done a quarter i can see by the i think maybe go for it yeah um, i'd like to leave you with this this is quite profound i don't uh, leave the previous statement that it's been changed right, right? Take a look at the Dead Sea Scrolls, right? They compared the Dead Sea Scrolls, which weren't uncovered until, don't quote me on this, was it 1947, 48? 47, 48? 47 and 48, yeah. Okay, take those Dead Sea Scrolls and all the books that were in there from the Old Testament, and then they compared them with what the, new, with what the Old Testament is today. Guess how many errors there were? Tonight. Let me know. If that, don't quote me, there were five spelling errors in all the books. Yeah, there was a thousand years difference between the Dead Sea Scrolls and the previous oldest documents available. A thousand years of copying, and there were, as far as any professional is concerned, no mistakes, no changes. <laughs> so be careful with those assertions that the Bible's been changed. Be careful well, with that. Yeah, I will be careful with that. But how do you know the Dead Sea Scrolls aren't ah, 150 years old? Ah, that, <laughs> that chronology is something I'd love to get into. I think we should just leave. Carbon dating? Uh, yeah, exactly. Leave. <laughs> leave. Leave there. Carbon dating my ass. I've heard such a pile of shit in all, all my life. They're accommodating me. Okay, okay. Yeah, 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 you know better. You're right. Uh, point being, I think I think we're, we're, we're wandering off the, the, to the point of, of, of a, a separate point there. So let, let, let's bring it back, John. We're, we're up to there, like I think a savage says, 
We're only a quarter of the way in, so let's 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 rock on and get to another. And I'm mean, I tell you, what, let's get to another theological point because that's this is what you're triggering here. These are, as John said, these are the questions we got thrown out of Sunday school for. But actually, the reason we're interjecting isn't. It's nothing more than actually. That's a really bloody good point that one answer to that I've never asked before, and I'm enjoying this guy. So as long as you're uh, digging where we're coming from, let, let let's rock on, yeah. Well, Paula, you guys are going to have to start centralizing some serious caffeine. Paula, I think Paula and I, we're up for it. Yeah. Let's roll. Rock on. Um, so for no all of more the interrupt texts. Okay, that's a um. Okay, here we go. That's a catchphrase in Christianese in theology. A proof text is like cherry picking, right? If you want to prove your theological point, just find a verse. Look, this verse says this. This is what this is. What the Bible says it. Bible says it. So a proof text is like cherry picking. Oh, you're going to wish you never said that, son. Travis, so all the proof texts, that's a catchphrase for Christianese and theology. A proof text is like cherry picking, right? If you want to prove your theological point, just find a verse. Look, this verse says this. The Bible says it. The Bible says it. So a proof text is like cherry picking. Number one, another generalized sweeping ipsy digsit baseless bare assertion fallacy. So your so equals therefore. You had no premises that is reasons supporting your therefore. Train wreck conclusion. Number one. Number two, nowhere at any time has anyone of sound mind ever claimed scripture, scripture proof texts were cherry picks. I will guarantee you don't even know what it means. You and about 90% of the population. Let's find out what it means. From Wiki, cherry picking, suppressing evidence, or the fallacy of incomplete evidence is the act of pointing to individual cases or data that seem to confirm a particular position while ignoring a significant portion of related case or data that may contradict that position. It's a kind of fallacy of selective attention, the most common example of which is the confirmation bias. So, cherry picking, of which quote mining is a form of, is never claimed ambiguously or generally. Each claim must be rigorously supported. A, the specific passage or citation in question is clearly identified, and B, the passages in the same document claiming the antithesis of the specific passage or citation in question is or are identified, then compared to validate the claim. You haven't accomplished that. You just declared it. Special note. If an author makes a claim, then contradicts the same exact claim within the same document, then the author is a moron. Your juvenile belly laughing erroneous propy conjured claim here is employed to, again, grease the skids for the onslaught of all your unsupported blasphemous, shroom induced horseshit to sold sway over and undermine the word of God. If you thought all the above was del delusional made up horse pucky, you ain't seen nothing yet. So, do we want to stop here? Because this is important, and this drives me nuts. Right? We're going to stop here, this cherry-picking nonsense. I think, I think, I think, maybe, Paula, you could um, put, the, put that in a, in a more refined way that with regards to what, what, what in your guys' opinion, is occurring. Um, what, what I see him saying yeah, is that objective. only literalists cherry pick. When the fact is that allegorists equally can be accused of cherry picking. And in fact, every one of his criticisms of the literal method can be thrown right back in his face. Because again, this is not a method problem. This is a people problem. An individual person either cherry picks or they don't. I've seen people do it on whether they were allegorists or literalists on both ends of the extreme. But the point is that for him, what he's implying is that if you're a literalist, you are cherry picking. And with this is completely false, it's a non sequitur. We, you know, you can't make a blanket statement like that. You can only say that individual cherry picked or that individual 
uh, you know, just ignoring contrary evidence. As the saying goes, a text without a context is a pretext for a proof text. So context is what, yeah, the, what literalists are all about context. Okay. With allegory, you don't even need context. So if anybody could be accused of cherry picking, I would think it would be the allegorist because it's part of the definition of the term. You know, if, if you're going to say that there's a fourth language that really throws out the other three, then nothing matters in the context. Context is nothing. Everything revolves around the fourth language, which is a story that you think the book is telling without regard for context, without regard for language. Exactly, so, Paula. Uh, yeah. Exactly. That's so, really, that to me is, is as, as I've spoke to you about the, 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 uh, the, the, the paradigm of historical and, and uh, allegorical, actually, if you're going to invoke a fourth language, then in most cases, and this is if you look at the Paleo-Hebrew, then the alpha, the alpha, etc. It has a it has a bull symbolism to it. So even the precursory origins of the Paleo Hebrew have a secondary meaning. Now, if you're then going to ascribe all those additional meanings to that, you can't use uh, the character uh, in. Uh, a precursory language, which is an ad adaptation afterwards, to ascribe allegorical meaning within the character as well. For me, it's it. There comes a point where the language derivation and the the construct used to describe, if you're going to take it historically, that you have to draw a line and stop backtracking on. For you, does that make any sense? <laughs> you get what I'm saying. There comes a point where. You know, you can use, start to use fourth languages, um, but they're only relevant um, within a certain paradigm. And to cite them as evidence, you kind of have to place them. And for me, pre-cursory understanding of the uh, uh, characterial meanings of the precursors of things like ALF and the lights, they're not understood. And to try and associate them with any other meaning, particularly when we try to uh, have Bible codes and the likes, it, um, for me, that's not right. And there comes a point where you have to draw a, a, a line under where you're going to inscribe meaning into the text. Right. It's so it's very arbitrary. Um, and what the literal method does is exactly what you were describing, where, you know, if you just think in common sense terms of like, if you sit down to write a letter, your words are not coming from just random pickings from the dictionary, you have something, some thought in mind that you're trying to convey, and you're going to use the tools at your disposal to do that. And as we see, like I mentioned about rolling chats in YouTube, that goes horribly wrong all the time when people are not trying to be symbolic, they're not trying to hide codes in their words, and yet we so totally misunderstand each other all the time, and people build entire scenarios out of the misunderstandings, and that's why people split and, you know, all kinds of bad things happen. But when we're dealing with a language that has been really etched in stone for thousands of years, right, it's, we've got these old documents, however long anybody wants to believe they are ago. The point is that they're old, right? And they're not continually changing unless you want to get into Mandela effect, which I'm not going to do at all. But because I, I, I don't believe in that, I did a video on that. But the thing is that at some point, you have to decide whether you're going to be objective and consistent or not, which allegory by definition cannot be. It can only be what someone's impression is. And yes, everybody does that. We read something and we interpret through a, a context of many layers. Language has many complexities in it, and we all know how limited it is just to write it because you can't see people's expressions. You don't know where they're coming from. They don't have the time in, in a rolling chat to explain their backdrop. Yet somehow we get along most of the time. You know, We communicate for the most part. 
but when it's just written words in a culture that's foreign to us from a time that none of us lived in, we really have to be have a an objective, consistent method of interpreting those words. And as soon as you invoke allegory, you might as well not bother even looking at the text because it's whatever you want it to mean. And that that's why we, as I said at the beginning, why we can't ever agree. Travis and me will never agree on much of anything in the Bible because we're using such mutually exclusive paradigms to look at it. Do, do you see a parallel here with um, sort of science and pseudoscience where, like you're saying, um, as soon as you invoke the multiverse, then or simulation theory or some other made up thing, then the, it's literally all all borders are, are just thrown away you, right. you know, and anything goes. Yes, you're exactly right. right. You're exactly right. He's the pseudoscientist and we're the scientists. You got it. Yeah, it seems inconsistent for me for flat earthers, especially to abandon appeal to science and evidence and personal observation when it comes to the Bible and throw away all those principles of we demand evidence as people have done for hundreds of years demanding so much evidence for the Bible. And now with allegory, you don't even need it, and you're in the same boat as pseudoscience. You really are. But it almost seems yep. as though, you know, physical observations and things that you and I can go out and do are corroborating the Bible. Yes. Yes. You know, to, as much as that sort of irks me as um, <laughs> a, an atheist that used to be an agnostic or whatever the hell um i'm now in a position where i i believe and it is my belief only that we were created but that but yeah <laughs> the strange people place to be in people are complicated yeah you know it uh Anything else? Do we this is going to be a big chunk right here. Well, uh, be, before only, John uh, gets you to baptize him, move on. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be a pretty big chunk right here. Uh, not only with what he says, but my rebuttal to it. So we're going to get through a healthy chunk here. So any everyone, don't fall asleep. Uh, we're we're going to get medieval. Go for it, John. Go for it. Such as Israel. Correct. Correct. So the Bible as a whole is a sacred text for the nation of Israel. Okay. So right there, you're limited to the scope of uh, revelation. And by revelation, that is that a particular God has revealed himself to a particular people. God didn't go to the Egyptians. He didn't go to the Babylonians. He didn't go to the Chinese. He didn't go to the Australia. You know, he went to Israel. So right there, even the texts themselves are limited in, ter in terms of their direct immediate audience. That also then applies to the idea of uh, geography, of land. Um, now, I I'm not going to be able to say everything. I I'm going to say something that might elicit a, a, a question in someone's mind, and, and I'm not going to answer it perhaps. Um, but I, you know, we, we only have so much time. Uh, I'll try to do the best I can if anybody from the chat wants to put anything out there. But um, but yes, so when the Bible wants to be specific, right, if the Bible is not talking about the nation of Israel, it might be more specific as the, the land of Babylon or the land of Ethiopia or the land of Shinar, okay? So it'll be specific that way. But in all other aspects, even when it doesn't designate the land of Israel, it is talking about the land of Israel, because the land of Israel becomes a metaphor for Israel in her relationship with God. And I'll try to touch on that um, as best I can as, as we go on. Does, does anybody have any question thus far? Just uh, can you define what, what you mean by Israel? Is it, um, I mean, when you say her relationship with God, it, it, is it a geographical place or is it um, a mythical figure or an allegory or, or how do you define it? 
the the nation of Israel would be encapsulated in the 12 tribes of Israel. And then they all have marked out for them certain territorial boundaries that are in that geographical location. Okay, so if you wanted to go into the book of Leviticus and the book of Exodus, the book of Deuteronomy, and even Numbers, all of those are going to have certain references and designations for geographical boundaries. The tribe of Dan had a certain plot of land that was for the tribe of Dan. The tribe of Issachar, the tribe of Judah, the tribe of Benjamin, they all had their designated plots of right. territory. Trav, can I ask a question there? Because I know we, we, we discussed that growth, that population growth, um, and its net effect. So are you talking then with regards to the, a territory, uh, a biblical designation? So irrespective of what happens after that time where people go, you're talking a biblical designation of specific lands, sp supposedly in what is now Palestinian area. I think that I can answer that in a generic yes. <laughs> yeah, I didn't want. I'm not, I'm not. That is. I'm not really sure what you were asking, but enough of what you asked, I think I can just say yes, and I think that that will suffice as an answer. Yeah. Without being too obtuse. There's, there's no hidden meaning. It was as general as that. Is that when you're talking about the, if we're talking about the people of Israel, that can be quite specific and spread over time, and the, the land they cover can be varied. So what let I'm me, saying let me is, say... is it, are you taking a biblical description of the allotted areas, and that defines the land mass? Yes. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Again, so it's it's my position that translating the word as earth, Eretz, translating the word as earth is an interpretation of the original language. Okay. Because again, at its base, at its base level, again, Eretz in the Hebrew or in the Greek, uh, G-E, gay, gamma, a, gamma, eta, okay, that's just two letters, gamma, eta, and pronounced gay which is where we get geography. So it's just GE, right? So geodetic geography, GE, you follow me? That GE is the Greek word for land. It does not mean earth. You're gonna wish you never said that, son. Travis, it is my position that translating the word as earth, Eretz, is an interpretation of the original language. <laughs> really? Because at its base level, Eretz in Hebrew or in the Greek, G-E, Gamma Eta. Boy, that's real impressive. I'd like to see you do that again. Can you say Gamma Eta for us? Pronounced gay is the Greek word for land. It does not mean earth. Really? Your position is based on what? The same support you provided for all the bollocks you spewed so far? You didn't provide any cowbell here. Friggin' nothing. That's what you provided. Just another in a long list of baseless Ipsy digs it. He himself said that's what Ipsy digs it means. Just he himself said fallacies. By the way, Strong's number H776, Eretz, Eretz, from an unused root, probably meaning to be firm. The earth at large or partitively, a land, common, country, earth. Field, ground, land, you're getting the picture. Your gamma eta, Strong's number G, 1093. Gay, contracted from a primary word, soil, by extension a region, or the solid part of the whole of the terrene globe, including the occupants in each application. Country, earth, ground, land, world. You're finished with that nonsense. Moreover, from stratusvideo.com, translation and interpretation. Translation deciphers meaning of the written word, one language to another. Interpretation conveys meaning of the spoken word from one language to another. The common thread is language. <laughs> the common thread is colors, but black and yellow are different. However, the two professions require very different skills, if you get my drift. The second point, Travis. 
So when the Bible wants to be specific, right? If the Bible is not talking about the nation of Israel, it might be more specific as the land of Babylon or the land of Ethiopia or the land of Shinar, okay? So it'll be specific that way. But in all other aspects, even when it doesn't designate the land of Israel, it is talking about the land of Israel. Oh, really? And your support for this is what? This cockamamie made up horse bucky is what? What's your support? Number one, the land was identified here in Genesis 15, 18. In the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed I have given this land, from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. Right? So the land is identified. The birth of Israel as a nation, not the land, the promised land, doesn't occur until Exodus 19, 5 through 6. Now, therefore, I've read this before. Now, therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. For all the earth is mine, and ye shall be unto a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak, the children of Israel. Now, we're going to put to the test your statement here that in all other aspects, even when it doesn't designate the land of Israel, it is talking about the land of Israel. Okay, you didn't give any cowbell. I'm going to give some cowbell. So in every place that the earth appears in the following scriptures, and there's a lot of them, we're going to put the land of Israel in there because that's what you told us it meant. Right now, I'm going to take passages from before Exodus and after Exodus to be comprehensive because the ones before Exodus are a belly laugher for you because it has nothing to do with the children of Israel just yet. So let's go through it. Genesis 1 1 1, uh, 1, 1 2. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the land of Israel, and the land of Israel was, was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So we're looking for continuity, right? Continuity, non sequiturs. That's what we're looking for. This was a bit non sequitur, don't you think? It's going to get much worse for you. Genesis 1.10, And God called the dry land the land of Israel, and the gathering together of the waters he called he seas. And God saw that it was good. What about every place else? Huh? Genesis 1.11, and God said, let the land of Israel bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the land of Israel, and it was so. What about everywhere else besides the land of Israel that wasn't even identified yet? Genesis 1, uh, 1, chapter 1, verse 12. And the land of Israel brought forth grass, the herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good. Only in the only in Israel, though, right? Genesis 1, 14 through 15. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the land of Israel. And it was so. So just light on the land of Israel, not anywhere else. Continuity, non sequitur. Continuity error, sorry, non sequitur. Genesis 1, 16 through 17. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the land of Israel, but not anything else. Genesis 1, 12. And God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters and the seas and let the fowl multiply in the land of Israel. Just in the land of Israel, not anywhere else. Genesis 1, 24, 25. And God said, let the land of Israel bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth after his kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the, of the land of Israel after his kind and the cattle of, after their kind and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. You see any continuity errors in here and non sequiturs? Genesis 1, 26 through 28, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the land of Israel and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the land of Israel. So God created man in his own image and the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. 
And God blessed them and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the land of Israel and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the land of Israel. You guys ought to be getting the, the gist of where I'm going with this, right? I don't have to stop with non-continuity non -continuity and non-sequiturs. Genesis 129, 30. And, and God said, behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the land of Israel and every tree and which is the fruit of the tree yielding seed to you shall be for meat. And to every beast of the land of Israel and to every fowl of the air and to everything that creepeth upon the land of Israel, wherein there is life. I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so, right? Not anywhere else, just the land of Israel. Genesis 2, 1, thus the heavens and the land of Israel were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. So he made the heavens and the land of Israel, but not anything else. Genesis 9, 1, and God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the land of Israel which hasn't been de designated yet, by the way. Genesis 10, 32, these are the families of the son of Noah and their, after their generations in their nations. And by these were the nations divided unto the land of Israel after the flood. <laughs> Genesis 11, 1, and the whole land of Israel was of one language and of one speech. Genesis 11, 4, and they said, go to, let us build a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven and let us make us, let us make us a name lest we be scattered upon the face of the whole land of Israel. Genesis 12, 3, And I will bless them that bless thee, and I curse them that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the land of Israel be blessed, but not anywhere else, just the land of Israel. Genesis 14, 19, And he blessed them, and he said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and the land of Israel. So just heaven, the land of Israel, not anywhere else. Genesis 18, 18, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great mighty nation and all the nations of the land of Israel shall be blessed in him. Non sequitur. So, sort of uh, seeing a uh, pattern here. Do you see a pattern? Oh, we got more. We got to do more. I'm sorry. I thought now, so. Genesis 26, 4, and I will make thee thy seed to multiply as the stars of heaven and I will give unto thee thy seed all these countries, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the land of Israel be blessed. Non sequitur. And the famine was all over the face of the land of Israel, and Joseph opened up the storehouses and sold unto the Egyptians, and the famine waxed sore in the, in the land of Egypt. So obviously, this is continuity here, non sequitur. This is, this is really important. The flood. Genesis 6, 7. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created, from the face of the land of Israel, both man and beast and creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. So he's going to destroy everything from the land of Israel, not anywhere else. And God said unto Noah, the end of all flesh is come before me. The land of Israel is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them and the land of Israel. But everything, every other place is safe. Genesis 6, 17, and behold, even I do bring a flood of waters upon the land of Israel to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under heaven, and everything that is in the land of Israel shall die. So that means just the people in the land of Israel, not anywhere else. Genesis 7, 17, and the flood was 40 days upon the land of Israel, and the waters increased and bare up the ark, and it was lift, upon, lift up above the earth. Genesis 7, 18, and the waters prevailed and were increased greatly upon the land of Israel, and the ark went upon the face of the waters, not anywhere else. 7, 19, Genesis, and the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the land of Israel, and all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. So all the, all the hills under all of heaven were covered, and just the land of Israel. Continuity, non sequitur. Genesis 7, 20, 21. And all flesh died and moved upon that moved upon the land of Israel, both of fowl and of cattle and of beast and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the land of Israel and every man. But nowhere else, just the land of Israel. This is a continuity error because all flesh would have to be in the land of Israel and only the land of Israel. Genesis 7 20, Genesis 7 23, and every living substance was destroyed, which was upon the face of the ground, 
both man and cattle and creeping things and the fowl of heaven, and they were destroyed from the land of Israel. And Noah only remained alive, and they that remained with him in the ark. So only in the land of Israel. Genesis 7, 24, and the waters prevailed upon the land of Israel 150 days. So this, this by extension, by proxy, states that the local, it has to be a local flood. That is the land of Israel. Number one, if the flood wasn't the whole earth, then why did Noah have to take the animals on the ark? Wasn't there animals living in other places? Number two, why build the ark? Why not just tell Noah to move? He had a 120 year warning. Number three, why build an ark over 400 feet long if it was only a local flood? Number four, if the flood was local, then didn't God break his promise not to flood the earth? Israel, per you, again, hasn't Israel experienced many floods since Noah? Number five, if the flood was local, why would birds have been sent on board? Couldn't they have simply winged across to the nearest nearby mountain range? Number, this is really important because all this is absolutely silliness above. Listen to this. Matthew 24, 37 through 39. But as the days of Noah were, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying, giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the son of man be. So if people would have happened not to live in Israel, the land of Israel, they would have not been affected and would have escaped God's judgment. What did Jesus mean when he directly compared the coming judgment of all men to the days of Noah? Is the coming judgment only a partial judgment based on geography? An Israel only judgment? In Genesis 7:11, God said the fountains of the great deep broke open and the windows of heaven were open. Was just this the fountains of the great deep underneath Israel? Was this just the windows above Israel? Let's continue. Exodus, and they did so, for Aaron stretched out his hand with a rod and smote the dust of the land of Israel, and it became lice and man and a beast, and all the dust of the land became lice throughout the land of Egypt. Continuity and non sequitur. Exodus 9.33, still no people of Israel just yet. And Moses went out of the city of Pharaoh and spread abroad, spread abroad his hands unto the Lord, and the thunders and hail ceased. And the, the rain was not poured upon the land of Israel. Yeah, but he wasn't his, in Israel. He was in Egypt. Exodus 10, 15. Post-designation for the people of Israel. The nation of Israel was born as of Exodus 9. Let's see how it goes. For they covered the face of the whole land of Israel, so that the land was darkened, and they did eat every herb of the land and all the fruit of the trees, which the hail had left. And there remain not any green thing in the trees or in herbs of the field throughout the land of Egypt. Continuity, non sequitur. Exodus 24, thou shalt not make un unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the land of Israel beneath or that is in the water underneath the earth. But that's okay. If you make something in another place beside the land of Israel, you're good. Exodus 20, 11, for in six days, the Lord made the heaven and the land of Israel, the sea and all that in them is, and rested on the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So he made the sea and all in heaven and just the land of Israel, nothing else. Job, behold, he withholdeth the waters and they dry up. Also, he sendeth them out and they overturn the land of Israel, just the land of Israel, nowhere else. He directed it under the whole heaven and his lightning unto the ends of the land of Israel. So it's a good thing that they're going out under the whole heaven, but just under the land of Israel, right? Continuity, non sequitur. Continuity error, non sequitur. When I say continuity, I, I mean continuity error. Job 37, 12, and it is turned around about his counsels that they may do whatsoever he commanded them upon the face of the world in the land of Israel. So how can you be on the face of the world and the land of Israel at the same time? Continuity, non sequitur. Job, 30, Job 38, 36. Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee, and answer thou me. Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the land of Israel? Declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? 
How do you stretch a line upon a curved foundation, by the way? I digress. Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? And who laid the cornerstone thereof? Non sequitur. Job 38, 13, that it might take hold of the ends of the land of Israel, that the wicked might be shaken out of it. So I guess there's no wicked other than the people in the land of Israel, right? Non sequitur. Job 38, 26, to cause it to rain on the land of Israel, where no man is, on the wilderness where there is no man. This is a train wreck. Makes no utter, this is utter nonsense. Psalms 2, 8 through 12. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the of the land of Israel for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings, ye instructed, ye judges of the land of Israel. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are they that put their trust in him. This is a non sequitur continuity error. Revelation, let's jump there. And shall go out to deceive the nations which are, in the, which are in the four quarters of the land of Israel, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is the sand of the sea. This is a continuity non sequitur. Qu four quarters of the land of Israel? Gog and Magog are the southern steps of Russia. No, this is nonsense. Revelation 19, 19, and I saw the beast and the kings of the land of Israel and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. Just the kings of the land of Israel, I guess. Of course, Israel is the one that's getting attacked. So this is a complete train wreck. Revelation 17, 5, and upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abominations of the land of Israel. So it's just the land of Israel. She's just the mother of harlots and the abominations of the land of Israel. Nowhere else. Revelation 14, 18 through 19. And another angel came out, of, out from the altar, which had power over fire, and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, thrust in sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the land of Israel, for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust, thrust in the sickle unto the land of Israel and gathered the vine of the land of Israel and cast it into the great, great wine press of the wrath of God. This is non sequitur, obviously. Revelation 12, 12, therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the land of Israel and of the sea. For the devil is, is come down unto you having great wrath because he knoweth he hath but a short time. So he's just come down. Woe to the inhabitants of the land of Israel. Only the land of Israel. They, they're the only ones that have to be concerned. Everyone else, you're good to go. Nothing to see here. Revelation 3.10. Because thou hast kept thy word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell in the land of Israel. Continuity error, non sequitur, right from the uh, uh, lips of Jesus. 2 Peter 3.10, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. The land of Israel also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. There's all kinds of things wrong with this. Just doesn't flow, uh, flow does it? Colossians 3.2, set your affection on things above, not on the things on the land of Israel. But if you set your affections on things in the land of Paris or, or New York or Mexico, you're good. Colossians 1, 16 through 17, for, him, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in the land of Israel, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things and by him all things consist. So everything in heaven, and that are in the land of Israel, but no, and all these guys, but nowhere else. Ephesians 6, 3, that it may be, be well with thee, and thou that they may, let me try that again. Ephesians 6, 3, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest liveth long on the land of Israel. What if you're living somewhere else? 
Does, does that mean short life? Acts 13, 47, for so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the land of Israel. Is that just, what are Gentiles doing in the land of Israel? Continuity error, non sequitur. Acts 3, 25, ye are children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made of, which are with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, and thy seed shall be all the kindreds of the land of Israel be blessed, but nowhere else. Acts 1, 8, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the land of Israel. Makes perfect sense. John 12, 32. And I, if I be lifted up from the land of Israel, will draw all men unto me. How can he draw all men unto him if he's just lifted up in Israel? John 3, 31. He that cometh from above is above all. And that, he, and he that is of the, of the land of Israel is the land of Israel. -y. And speaketh of land of Israel, he that cometh from heaven is above all. Luke 21, 25 through 27, and there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the land of Israel, distress of nations <laughs> with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's heart failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the land of Israel, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then shall, he, and then shall they see the son of man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Continuity error, non sequitur. A few of a couple of them here. Mark 13 31. Heaven and the land of Israel shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. So, heaven and just the land of Israel and the other places they're good to go, along with his word. Matthew 23 9. And call no man your father upon the land of Israel, for one is your father which is in heaven. So, if your father is not part of the land of Israel, you can go ahead and call him your father. You're good to go. Second Peter 3, 3 through 6. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lust, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of, cre of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the land of Israel standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. Continuity error, non sequitur. Zechariah 5.3. Then said he unto me, this is the curse that goeth forth over the face of the whole land of Israel. For every one that stealeth shall be cut off as on this side according to it. And every one that sweareth shall be cut off as on the side, that side according to it. So, if you steal and you sweareth out of the land of Israel, you're good to go. Amos 9, 8 through 9. Behold, the eyes of the Lord God are upon the sinful kingdom, and I will destroy it from, the, from off the face of the land of Israel. <laughs> Saving that I will not utterly destroy the house of Jacob, saith the Lord. That is the land of Israel right there. For lo, I will command, and I will sift the house of Israel among all nations. Like as corn is sifted in a sieve, yet shall not the least grain fall upon the land of Israel. <laughs> that is a colossal train wreck, two passages. The Aramaic, Daniel 7.23, thus he said, the fourth, the fourth beast shall be fourth kingdom upon the land of Israel which shall be diverse from all kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth. Sorry, I missed that one, earth. That shall devour the whole land of Israel and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. Continuity here, non sequitur. Daniel 7, 4. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings, and I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the land of Israel and made stand upon the feet as a man, and, and, and a man's heart was given to it. He's talking here about Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon. So how can he be in Babylon and him talking was lifted up from the land of Israel? 
continuity error, non sequitur. Ezekiel, so that the fishes of the sea and the fowls of heaven and the beasts of the field and all creeping things that creep upon the land of Israel and all the men that are upon the face of the land of Israel shall, shall shake at my presence and the mountains shall be thrown down and the steep places shall fall and every wall shall fall to the ground. Only in the land of Israel. Jeremiah, Babylon hath been a golden cup in the Lord's hand that made all the land of Israel drunk drunken the nations have drunken of her wine therefore the nations are mad uh continuity error non sequitur jeremy jeremiah 23 5 behold the days come saith the lord that i will raise unto david a righteous branch and a king shall reign and prosper and shall execute judgment and justice in the land of israel only in the land of israel every else every other place don't worry about it Jeremiah 10.10, 10, but the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and everlasting King. At his wrath, the land of Israel shall tremble and the nation shall not be able to abide in his indignation. So it's a continuity error again, non sequitur. Almost done. Isaiah 45.18, for thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the land of Israel and made it. He hath established it. He created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord, and there is none else. Non sequitur. Didn't he make anything else beside the land of Israel? Isaiah 42, 4. He shall not fail nor be discouraged till he have set judgment in the land of Israel, and the isles shall wait for his law. Continuity error? Non sequitur. Psalms 8, 9. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the land of Israel. Not anywhere else. Second Chronicles and all the kings of the land of Israel sought the presence of Solomon to hear his when wisdom that the that God had put in his heart. This continuity here, this makes no sense whatsoever. All the kings of the land of Israel? Really? Huh. What about um oh goodness, I can't recall her name. I'll get back to her. Let me finish it up. I know you guys are you guys still there? No. <laughs> Deuteronomy 14 2 for thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God and the Lord hath chosen thee to be a peculiar people unto himself above all the nations that are upon the land of Israel um there you go do it do with it what you will the queen of Sheba you were trying to think of yes, queen, of I Sheba. Was. queen of Sheba where was she from uh sheba <laughs> <laughs> yeah not the land of israel i'm not i'm i'm probably being a bit thick here can you just go through that again john for me i'm not <laughs> sure the point <laughs> <laughs> no you very very well made your point I, I think if I were to summarize all that, I would just say there were. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. That was my fault. I was just saying it's drawing a wavy line around parts that are deemed allegorical or Israel or whatever it is. It's just drawing a wavy line, as, as they used to call in statistics courses, drawing the target after the shots are fired. So every time you find something that, that isn't specified, you say you, you do what you just did. 50 times, you know, saying it just can't make consistent set sense. And you have to make exceptions every step of the way, which is another fallacy. I don't, I don't know if you mentioned, um, uh, the word just escaped me. What is that, uh, special pleading where you just, like I said, draw wavy lines around it. It's special pleading. Well, in this case, it's obvious. It means something else. No, it isn't. Not with the allegory method which is very, very inconsistent. I, I don't know if any would have, and do you have any comment with that? I mean, is this is a slam dunk? Yeah, he definitely made it very apparent that he's talking about, the book is talking about more than just the land of Israel. I think for, for me, um, and what we specifically talked about previously in terms of um, when we look at translation and meaning 
Um, I think from the multitude of those passages, I think to just, just in all honesty, to just translate the land of Israel back to the word earth is probably a little disingenuous as well. You think? Yeah. I think, I think if we're trying to understand the complexity of other people's language, um, then the most apparent form is what's used there when we translate into English as earth. But I think in a lot of those passages, um, there would be cultural meanings and not necessarily would it literally be a direct translation of the word earth particularly as the understanding of that we associate with the word earth as certainly as flat earthers you would question what does that mean actually um if, if we were just to take that literal translation and ask a flat earther and a ball earther uh, the implications of the translational and uh, colloquial uh, understanding of that are, are massive if you apply them spiritually. So I say I'm not being overly critical, but I think to just say that what we've got to do is translate every single one of them back to that is probably a little oversimplistic as well. I think the point you make is 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 correct in that in no way can we. There may be one passage where that is relevant and validatable but in no way as you list there uh, is a is a direct translation and presupposition that that interchange is acceptable and in many of the cases as you show john it's 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 a non sequitur and contradictory and, and nonsensical in in a lot of senses yep all right want to move on yeah, let's rock on. So all translation to a certain extent is interpretation. You cannot, I, I don't care what you think or what you say. There is no translation out there that is purely word for word. It's just not. Thank you very much. Travis. All translation to a certain extent is interpretation. You cannot, I don't care what you think or what you say, there is no translation out there that is purely word for word. It's just not. This is a colossal non sequitur fallacy. So this gives you authority to allegorize all of scripture. And wrong! Psst. Translation deciphers meaning of written words from one language to another. Like I said before, interpretation conveys meaning of the spoken word from one language to another. The common thread is language. However, the two professions require very different skills. You, you made an equivalent between translation and interpretation. From translationalcentral.com, the key difference between translation and interpretation lies within the choice of communication channel. Simply put, Translation deals with written communication, while interpreting is all about the spoken word. Both translators and interpreters have a deep linguistic and cultural knowledge of their working languages, as well as the ability to communicate clearly and succinctly. It is, however, important to highlight the distinctive features of these two professions. From NZT International, as a company that specializes in both translation and interpreting, we often get asked what the difference between interpretation and translation is. While both services involve adapting one language to another, there are a number of important differences between the disciplines. While there are vast differences between both interpreting and translation, and understanding of the subject matter is crucial to both disciplines. So you don't care what we say, huh? Right? You just got crushed again. Questions, comments. Yeah, word for word, what he's talking about and misrepresenting, in my opinion, is the fact that you, nobody 
on any topic or any language would say that you could just get out two dictionaries and be a translator. That would be word for word. That's what nobody does. Literalists don't do that. What they do is get semantic range, such as, you know, people don't understand what semantic range is or how dictionaries are made. It's like with the English word trunk. What does it mean? Depends on context. Is it an elephant's nose, a box with a locking lid? Is it the base of a tree, a person's torso, male swimwear, the back end of a car? There's, you know, five or six different meanings of one word in English today whose meaning depends completely on its context. That's how you get these words in the first place. And if you translate with the dictionary in your hand, which one do you pick? You can't just pick them arbitrarily. You have to consider how the word is used everywhere and decide what the particular context is. And that's what he is calling interpretation as if it's arbitrary and especially ironic given the fact that allegory is even is interpretation on steroids. So what charge is he laying at the feet of, of literalists is beyond me. Outstanding point, Paula. Thank you very much. Sorry, I was muted there, John. Yeah, I think I'd leave it there. I think that's a a good point. It's it's very hard to read allegory into interpretation of a translation. Well, he was wrong at the base level, right? He was making equivalent statements between interpretation and translation. It's... <laughs> When I first heard it, I said, what in the world? Yeah, you ain't going to listen to anybody tell you any different because you're completely wrong. I don't know. Uh, are we ready to continue? Any other comments? Don't be intimidated. <laughs> I think, I think, I think that, I think, I think the, the length of that demonstrate the point equivocally i think you could i say go into individual okay do you want me to continue yeah let's let's rock on i think looking we at only that. got a couple more we're yeah, gonna see as you can see over here we're getting there right yeah all right there you go but if you listen to my bible podcast from a couple of years ago that's still available on youtube if you listen to that you will hear me at times say granny smith should not be reading the Bible. <laughs> do not give Granny Smith, do not give little Jimmy the Bible. Do not. Because, because it can they be interpreted. Are, so yes, yes. Literally they are, or... Yes. They are not going to know how to read it. And that... I'll tell you what. Travis. If you listen to my podcast from a couple years ago that's still available on YouTube, if you listen to that, you will hear me at times say, and he starts laughing, Granny Smith should not be reading the Bible. Do not give, do not give Granny Smith, do not give little Jimmy the Bible. Do not. They are not going to know how to read it. This is just me, all right? Okay, you are an antichrist, okay? And I'm gonna validate it down below, even more so, defined. So let me get this straight. Let's not give people God's word. Let them instead listen to Elmer Fudd delusional retards, you tell them what it says, Hey, eh? I'm gonna have to bow before him and give account of some pretty awful things. But let me tell you something, clown show. When you bow, please make sure I'm 30 billion light years away so I'm not even in the barely palpable wake of what's coming to you. Actually, I don't think 30 billion light years is adequate. Make it 100 gazillion light years minimum. Questions, comments? Wouldn't, wouldn't he is that, talking to... Oh, well, go ahead, sorry. I was just going to say, wouldn't that kind of distance require the presupposition of something like space to get that far away so. i was talking other dimensions yeah. thank you <laughs> uh, yeah back to you but I... 
I, I was just going to say he is calling himself the infallible interpreter. He's saying no one else can possibly get that fourth language right than him because Granny Smith, she makes good apples, by the way, um, <laughs> cannot possibly know the code, cannot possibly know how to allegorize the passages. Of course she can't because it isn't there. She's just going to read the words and do reading comprehension. Why can't she do that? This is why it's so ironic that at one point he appealed to the Catholic Church for something, I forget what, because they consider themselves, the, the magisterium at least, the infallible interpreter of scripture to the point where they can override it and make it something else or add or subtract from it. That's what an infallible interpreter is. That's the great one of the great objections the Protestants had, the reformers had to their own Catholic Church, is that magisterial attitude where they lock it up from the common people. That's, I mean, the Catholic Church put people to death for trying to translate the Bible into the common language of the people because they wanted to lock it up and keep it for themselves. So by being an infallible interpreter, saying Granny Smith and Johnny can't read the Bible for themselves. He's saying, you need to defer to your betters to tell you what it means, because you can't get it by reading comprehension. I, I find that extremely arrogant. Um, it was one of, the, one of the points of that show that I, I took a, f a fundamental objection to what what Travis said there, because I, I have, you know, I, I think, unlike you guys, I don't put the Bible as a, a fundamental word of God, but I do value it, and I don't consider it uh, a book of ranking that you should be ordered to be able to view. And, and I think probably like I've alluded to more more fundamentally earlier, I think as you develop spiritually and read that book, y you get more from it um, with a lot of other texts like that as well, you know. So I, I think that's probably either a very misunderstood point or a very incorrect point from Travis there, from, from my point of view, because for me, you know, it's a bit like, I'll use a Bible quote that I'll probably use very crudely and incorrectly, but Jesus said, don't, you know, don't cast your pearls onto swine. Well, to me, casting that Bible out isn't a pearl. It's a lifeline that, that sets you on a journey. Whether that continue along your path, my path, whoever, Travis's path, it doesn't really matter. It's a very useful tool for everybody. And to try and place it in a, a, a an area of just solely allegorical understanding that's only for the learned is is not my understanding of that book. Right. Yeah. I mean, to say the the whole history of of church infighting is all of, largely about that very concept that people might misinterpret it so you've got to let me interpret it for you to guard you from error but most of the biggest errors and the most tragedies have come from the controllers who said we have to interpret it and they got it totally wrong and a lot of people suffered and died for it so i think it, it's much safer in the hands of the average person in fact i think it was tyndale who was eventually martyred for saying things like, I, I will cause the lowly plowboy to know the Bible better than you do to some guy he was arguing with by mail. And that was his goal, was to get it into the hands of the common people so that they wouldn't be bound by an infallible interpreter. So I, again, this is a big deal, a very big deal. It's been, you know, has affected history to a very deep extent. And ruined a lot of lives because the Bible should be in everybody's hands. The more hands, the better, because then you have people cross-examining each other and doing what we're doing today instead of just saying yes to the magisterium or whoever it is, the, the allegorist in charge, 
who says, no, it's my allegory. As, I, as we mentioned, he, you see Dr. Michael Heiser's name again. He disagrees with other allegorists. He disagrees with Travis and they're both allegorists. So now who's the infallible interpreter? This question cannot be answered. And I think, again, knowing people, human nature being what it is, it's better to not have central control. It's good to have scholarship. It's good to have research. And it's also good to have people all examining the text. That's always better than a centralized authority, uh, I, in my opinion. I'll, I'll let QE move on. I'd summarize that. I, I totally agree. I think it's better that we debate what it means rather than we debate who should be able to read it. So, yeah, that, that's head on, QE. So I, I, I'm not a Hebrew scholar. I actually had a conversation with a good friend of mine I went to seminary with, and he... You might be muted. He um, went on to get his doctorate in, in Semitic languages. And I called him up and said, hey, this is the stuff that I'm thinking about today. I just wanted to run it past you. And he's like, I'm no Hebrew scholar, man. And this guy's got a PhD, right? <laughs> and so uh, yeah, we, had a, we, had a, we always have a great conversation. But... Um, you know, there. Yeah, I'm sure you always have a great conversation. So Travis admits that he's not a Bible scholar. Neither is his PhD in Semitic languages friend. Cool. Dr. Michael Heiser is. So renowned Bible scholar Heiser. Again, if one was truly consistent in interpreting the creation description in Genesis 1 at face value, along with other creation descriptions in both testaments, You'd come out with a round, flat earth, complete with a solid dome over the earth, and the earth supported by pillars with Sheol underneath. This is game, set, match. Do I, do I need to go over all the scriptures here? I don't think I need to. Go ahead, question, quick questions and comments here. Yeah, but you could take that another direction with Michael Heiser putting science as his final authority, you know, science so-called. But but the, yeah, the point is, he is a scholar, he is an expert, a demonstrated one, not strictly an academic. And he says, it, in his it's part of a critique against young earth creationists who are not flat earthers, saying they're being inconsistent in their human movie, and they are. But so is he, but that's beside the point. The point is, that he's an allegorist who understands that you still can't just arbitrarily, you know, pick the meanings out. And being an expert, he says, yeah, he, he would disagree with Travis's conclusions that the Bible's not a flat earth book. He says it is. And he's an allegorist and a Hebrew expert. So point taken. Two more sections. Just to let you know. Hang in there. All right. Well, b b before you go, that that's quite an interesting point. So you're saying um, that actually someone who's taking Travis's viewpoint, and again, I think Travis's point is, 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 is I think part of the criticism was it's all allegory, um, but we've got somebody here that is a Bible scholar that's into allegory but i'm not saying he he says it's all like i think travis is probably alluding to he's saying within what you can take it's an impossibility to come out with anything other than and uh, let me just share this for everyone else because you've highlighted it john um if one was truly consistent in interpreting the creation of genesis at face value you'd come out with flat earth complete with solid dome over the earth and solid supported by pillars, uh, which I remember Darren Nesbitt being laughed at a couple of years ago, uh, with shoal underneath, etc. Um, quite interesting. Yeah, we don't really much care what Dr. Michael Heiser thinks uh, of science. He's like everyone else. He doesn't know what that is. We only care for his uh, scholarly acumen with these languages and he told you what it simply meant period I don't think that's cool what well, let me all right we yeah. ready to roll yeah you're back on you're back on yeah I didn't move 
chapters it'll take me. I don't believe in hell. I don't believe Jesus is coming back in the future. I don't believe the Bible is written about our future. I mean, there is no church that is going to take me. Yeah, I wonder why. Maybe these are some reasons why. Travis, I don't believe in hell. I don't believe in Jesus. I don't believe Jesus is coming back in the future. I don't believe the Bible is written about our future. There is no church that's going to take me. Well, there's no third grade Catholic school student would take you seriously. Number one, hell. Here are the references to a non-existent place. Isaiah 514, therefore hell hath enlarged herself. So this non-existent place is enlarging and opened her mouth with them without measure and their glory and their multitude and their pomp and, and he that rejoices shall descend into it. So they're going into it, into a non-existent place. Isaiah again, 14, 15, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. So you're going down and it has sides of a non-existent place. Ezekiel, they also went down into hell with him unto them that be slain with the sword and they that were his arm that dwelt under his shadow in the midst of the heathen. Matthew 16, 18. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter and upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So this non-existent place has gates. Luke 10, 15, and thou Capernaum, which art exalted to heaven, shall be thrust down to hell. So you're down, down to a place that doesn't exist. Second Peter 2, 4, for if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to, again, hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness, so the place has chains too, to be reserved unto judgment. Revelation 118, Jesus himself, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and have the keys of hell and of death. So this non-existent place also has keys. Revelation 20, 14, and the death and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. So, so this non-existent place was cast into the lake of fire. Revelation 22, 12 through 13. Oh, this goes back to his comment about Jesus. I don't believe Jesus is coming back in the future. Revelation 22, 12 through 13, 13. And behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me to give every man according to his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. By the way, Revelation, this was written by John in... AD 90 from Patmos. Revelation 1 8, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which what which is and which was and which is to come. That's post 90 AD, the Almighty. 1 John 2 28, and now little children, abide in him that when ye shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Acts 1, 10 through 11, and while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. This was Pentecost. Has he come back yet? Don't think so. Revelation 3.11, behold, I come quickly. Well, to come quickly, you had to have left. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Revelation 1.7, behold, he cometh with the clouds, and every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him, and all the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. Number three. I am he that lived and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and have the keys of hell and of death. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter, hereafter, hereafter this point. Revelation 4.1, after this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was it 
was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things, the things which must be hereafter. Greek metatauta, that is hereafter. That means afterward. Quick comments and questions, and we'll end up with the final statements. And yeah, it's also a verse uh, about where it says that we have this blessed hope and we should long for the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, this is not us going to him. This is him coming to us. And I've gone over this, this whole belief system called preterism, which holds that there is nothing remaining to be fulfilled, even if they don't take things allegorically, they still believe that. And it's it's untenable on every level. It can it's was just totally destroyed because there are things that that you know, like that incident you just mentioned, where they are watching Jesus ascend into the sky, and an angel said, "He will come back just the way you saw him leave." That never happened. The preterists have to allegorize and say, "Yeah, he came, but you couldn't see him." You know, just believe us. You 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 know, ignore what that angel said or those two men said. Um, it's just ridiculous. It, it, like you said, a train wreck. Adam, you still awake? You're probably on mute. Yeah, you Christ. There, I was, I was, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> now, go on, Zach. Did you have something to say there? Or? No, I mean, they, they talk about it so much. And like you said, it comes from his mouth. He says he's going to return. So I don't, I don't know. I don't understand where he's coming from with saying that it doesn't say Jesus is coming back. Like, but I, I need to read it all the way through. I always, well, I won't even get into it now. We can talk about this afterwards. But yeah, no, I get exactly where you're coming from. It absolutely says in the book that it, he is coming back. And afterwards, everyone, is yeah, yeah after. after. Yeah, and, sorry to interrupt. Afterwards is coming really quickly in about 50 everyone, seconds. Everyone will see it. You know, this hasn't happened yet. I'd agree with you there. I think it's hard to paint that it's something that's been missed if, <laughs> if, you know, if it is a, right. if it is a physical event then it would be daft to present that we didn't quite see it because that wouldn't fit that would be not con in line with the text would it it wouldn't be with what's portrayed to have happened so you can't have an event that everybody sees that, that they didn't quite see um Increase the enthusiasm now. Well, it's it's not a lack of enthusiasm. It's 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 part kind of ponderance as you kind of try and muse through it. But it, you know, you, you, well, you've heard my response there. You know what I mean? It's yeah. There is there is that. I I, I struggle with that one as well. If you're gonna take that text, um, yeah. Move on, John. All right. Last <laughs> you section. Got me thinking too much. Last section. This is going to be quick. You ready? Am I up? Yep. Oh, God. What are your thoughts on Jesus then? Oh, dog. Very good As we're already up to our necks in yeah. boiling yeah. poo, we might as well yeah. go there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a very, very good question. Um, I, I don't have a problem remaining conservative and and saying that uh jesus was an historical figure all right question what are your thoughts on jesus then travis that's a very good question um uh i don't have a problem remaining conservative and saying that uh that jesus was a historical figure 1 John 2.22, who is a liar, but he that denieth that, that Jesus is the Christ. He is antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. 
I don't have to say anything else. I really don't because John just, just explained it for me. In conclusion, this is just my opinion. This is not the opinion of the people on this panel. This is purely mine. Everyone, everyone tracking. In conclusion, you are a proper demonstrated blasphemous, heretical, delusional retard that clumsily and with a belly laughing Bible acumen feebly attempts to put your take an avalanche carpet bomb barrage of unsupported ipsy dixit fallacies above the word of God. As John said above, you are an antichrist by definition. The end. Yeah, in, in fact, the whole, everything he said is not, there's nothing distinctively Christian about it. So, I mean, you could, he could easily pass for an astrotheologist or a syncretist um, and a lot of other ists as well, because they're not, there's nothing distinctively Christian because the Bible defines what a Christian is. And it's someone who believes that Jesus rose from the dead and follows him. This is what it means. And, and if you are an allegorist, and this is a problem that even Michael Heiser ran into, and I can't find it on his website anymore, where he said, yeah, I take the Bible as what he calls theological messaging, which is to say allegory. But the problem is, how do I say, because he's trying to be honest, how do I say that Jesus really rose from the dead? He didn't have an answer, because that's what corner allegory paints you into. And at that point, you have to decide, do you believe that or not? And if you don't, then by the Bible's definition, you're not even a Christian. You don't even have a dog in this hunt. So why are you looking at the Bible? You know, if you can't believe anything it says is anything about but a story about the nation of Israel and their people and their culture and their land, then why bother? Just write another story. I, I don't understand why people insist that they have it right and everybody else's story interpretation is wrong. Because if the Bible's words don't mean what they say in any normal reading comprehension manner, then what are we talking about? Fair point, Paul. I think from 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 me listening to that the, the last comment. Now, I mean, you know, did did, and and this is quite important whether it's allegorical, factual. Did, did, you know, did 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 Jesus exist in history? Well, I've got no doubt in my mind on that. Yes. Um, did. did did Jesus exist in the exist in the history that we're told is a different matter. You know what I mean? It's is that the history that we're told and the paradigm we're painted in? They're they're my questions, but to for me to to paint the whole story as or particularly you know the New Testament, um, the important bits um, as allegory is is is, is nonsense to me. It, to me, it is an account of events. Um, so whilst there may be lessons in life, as there, I think that's what, like what I said earlier, um, how we can use the spirit to gain extra truths and, and lessons for ourselves, not necessarily to share with others uh, in the text. Um, but that, for me, doesn't doesn't under undermine or take take away that, that this is this is a historical document of events for me um as some have said and and i'd probably ascribe to there there may be some movements changes but the, i don't think the general gist has changed um irrespective of translations or interpretations anyone else guys Um, great presentation. Yeah. I think you really uh, kind of summed it up a little bit there about, you know, people with the whole allegory thing and thinking that I don't think the creator would make a book that not everyone could read and understand 
Amen. There, there's even a blessing at the end of Revelation, or even in the first chapter also, where it says, blessed is the one who hears the words of this book. Um, and there's all sorts of other blessings of reading the words and heeding what God says. And to make it all into some kind of code that means something other than what's written is again, I have to ask, what's the point? Because especially even with Bible codes, I'm going to go in, don't want to go into that. But the problem with not having, you know, Paleo Hebrew especially, is that you can't possibly get a code out of the Masoretic text written in the early centuries AD. As people don't think about these things. It's, it's a huge, complex topic. I mean, the Bible has so many layers, so many so much history, so much culture, so much language issues that, like I've said, I've, I've spent my life studying it and I'm scratching the surface. That's, we're talking at least 45 years. And so when someone makes a blanket assertion or a statement of you know anything baseless or flippant, especially when appealing to study, um, it leaves me unimpressed to, to be polite <laughs> because this is not something to take lightly. I mean, this is a, you know, even for anyone who just takes it as literature and nothing more, it's still a very influential book in history and should be understood just to be an educated person, if you, you know, not necessarily a, an academically educated person, but just being aware of the world you live in and its context. Um, there's an awful lot that comes from that that makes sense of a lot of other things that people get expressions out of the Bible or uh, the discoveries have been made in archaeology because of it. Like, for example, the Bible talks about paths in the seas and somebody took that statement and said, I'm going to look for these certain currents and they found them. So it has value on some level for everyone. But when it becomes an allegory only to the point of absurdity, as we've seen, I just, as again, I can't fathom why a person would want to make any statements about the Bible that they consider authoritative in some way or superior to someone else's statements because it's all just whatever you want it to be. So, but again, I don't know why a non-Christian of any sort really has a deep interest in the Bible or wants to argue about it because why? <laughs> You know, I, I don't argue or have any interest in debating Hindus about the Vedas or the Bhagavad Gita or Mormons about the Book of Mormon or even Muslims about the Quran, which I've read. I've read both of those books. And I just like, OK, I read them to be familiar and I don't care to go to their forums and tell them how stupid they are or demand that they present uh, evidence of some document I found in a cave and add that to their canon. I, I just can't fathom that. And so when it comes to people, I, I don't know whether Travis claims to be a Christian or not. I thought he had in the past, but I may be mistaken. But if so, it's extremely puzzling to have this uh, method, which, as I said, is not distinctively Christian in the slightest. I, I just can't fathom that. That's, that. that's a good point, actually, in terms of, because obviously I alluded to it at the beginning, um, in terms of the, the response. And it's unusual for Iron Realm to get a response to a great deal. Um, but we did, and certainly I have in in number. And is it is it the fact, if if Travis is, is claiming to be a Christian, that he holds these views, that it's... Uh, or is it that he just holds these views with regards to the Bible? Is there a, a differential there? Because you can I see, I, I don't have the level of response. See, I have the interest, but I don't have the emo. Is it is it that because he says he's a Christian, but he views the Bible like this, that it, it offends you guys? Because Travis's opinions didn't offend me. I was intrigued by them, but not offended. Um, yeah, and, and if I may just interject that, I don't find, I mean, people say a lot of things about the Bible on any given day, whether they're claiming to be Christians or not. 
and I strongly disagree with them, but that doesn't mean I'm offended that someone would disagree with me, as most people assume, just because I'm Bible literalist, you know, they assume that I'm reacting because I'm offended. No, I'm reacting to disinformation. Um, like, so, 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 for example, when people say the Jesuits wrote the Bible, well, the Jesuits didn't exist till 1540, and the Bible was completed by 95 AD. So I have a factual objection to their claim, you know, and that's why it upsets me. It's the same reason flat earthers are upset by all earth teachings, because it's not true, and we're very passionate about truth. And I think one thing that we can all say we have in common is being truthers. And so when someone says something that's patently false and cannot be sustained by whatever topic it is, whether it's the Bible or cosmology or anything else, we people who are truthers should get upset, I think. And they, you know, others can call that a reaction or being afraid or whatever, you know, because or fault in us that they think we have. But the the bottom line for us, any us collectively as truthers is do we love truth enough to stand up when it's not being told? And that's what, you know, for whatever every people want to say about otherwise, my I know my own motives and my own motives are I'm about truth. And if somebody says the Bible says something, then I'm going to demand that they back it up. And if they can't, I would just want people to know that that can't be backed up, you know, so my motivation as a Christian and a, a lifelong student of the Bible is simply accuracy and honesty and being able to back up claims. You know, even if they, I, I could be totally wrong. Everybody should at least have that attitude. They could be totally wrong. But the important point is that we are seeking truth with the intent of finding it and not, you know, endlessly running around saying, well, maybe today this is true or that's true for me, but not for you. I, I just can't go there. I'm the kind of person who values evidence and logic and reason and consistency. And that's why I'm a Bible literalist and why I was so keen on getting a response to the claims that were made in the earlier video. Thank, thanks, Paul. John, do you, do you want to maybe round it up for us then, make your final points and... I'll leave it with you, pal. For... I said what I said, and I meant what I said. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Nah, thank, thank you. Uh, was, uh... I didn't know how long it was going to go on for in the middle. I generally thought, because <laughs> I know how long the, the Bible's a bloody long book, and I'm thinking the the. I mean, we could be here till 2021. I'm thinking because <laughs> technically he's got that much of a reference source. Um, but yeah, I enjoyed it, John. Cheers for the presentation. I hope people understand. And uh, and Paula, again, thank you for your efforts. I hope people understand the point that's been made. I hope you understand the points I've tried to make. It's, it's a really emotive subject. And I think, if nothing else, I've realised if people come at this from many different angles and the conversation we often have isn't the same conversation <laughs> if you if you if you catch my drift we all enter it with a lot of preconceptions and our own motivations on it and it was good to listen like i said it was important for me to not being a bible believing christian to actually grasp your viewpoint and i've enjoyed it so thanks for that guys and uh I look forward to the aftermath. I'll see what happens, and maybe we'll have a maybe we'll have a joint meeting of you guys because I think there's there's a lot in this, and um, I said I think opinions are shared by a lot of people. A lot of people have yours a lot, and you know, a lot of people have Travis's, and probably a hell of a lot more sit in the middle. So thanks, guys, and uh, keep you flat. God bless.